Hi everyone. I am very excited because I hear Ben is about to announce the name for this podcast. And yeah. I am on absolute pet books. Yeah, well, we've uh, thought long and hard about it. Um, and we never really came up with a decision. So <laughs> we're just going to go with uh, the, we're going to go with a, a little abbreviation. So this is the VGRS show. I oh, know it's just the VGR show, the video game review show. And uh, like our unnamed first episode, we're going to talk about, well, we're going to go through and have a bit of a look back and review some of the games we've been playing in the last month or so. I think it's been about a month since our last show. So uh, you're, normally we're joined by, uh, normally I'm joined by two co-hosts, but uh, this week or this month, I'm just joined by my regular Mr. Simon Adams. How are you doing? Hi, everyone. Sorry the cash isn't here. Yeah. He's got, uh, more important things to do. Yeah, he's got, uh, I think he's got guests or visitors over and he's, he's, he's tied up, but uh, he sends his best wishes. But um, <laughs> I think he was going to talk, uh, he's been playing Dark Souls 2. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pick it up on PC when it comes out later this month. So I'm going to, I'm going to nab him when I've played it and we'll have a, have a good one. <laughs> Maybe that's why he doesn't want to talk about it because <laughs> he's been playing Dark Souls 2. Yeah, man. I hear it's pretty, uh, pretty brutal. Like, it's it's strange because some of the I've been reading about it and some of the like the first game was fucking brutal man it was it was so good but it was hard as shit and then this new one it seems to like make some parts easier but then just makes other parts like much much harder and I don't know if it's gonna be balanced out or not like in the first game if you died you just kind of went back to the last checkpoint and all the enemies like the minor enemies respawned. Which is fair enough, you know, you fucked up, you made a mistake, you got to pay a price. But this one, in the second game, apparently your health, overall health gets reduced until you find a collectible that restores it. So <laughs> the more you die, the less overall health you have. That just sounds like pun- kicking you when you're down. So uh, Yeah, it, making it, uh, you've already failed once, so now let's make your second attempt harder. Yeah, it sounds like that. I, I don't know. I, I've heard very good things about Dark Souls 2, though, and I'm looking forward to playing it because the first one was really good. Um, it's got a decent trailer as well. I do like the trailer. It's had a few trailers, and they've kind of been all over the place. Some of them are really cool and atmospheric, and others are kind of leave you a bit scratching your head, you know, like a bit of what the <laughs> fuck with the going for with that. But probably yeah. like the game itself. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to it though. I, I I nearly did pick it up on the Xbox, but I fucking I feel like I bought so many games recently. It's just ridiculous. Like I was just thinking, we've had nothing since like the PS4 release. Yeah, I, I stretched out like Assassin's Creed Four and Battlefield Four so long, and then all of a sudden March has hit, and like shit, I've had I've got I've bought like three full price games. I was on the verge of buying Final Fantasy Ten and Ten Two HD remaster for the Vita. Yeah, no. um, you know, this uh, Fez has come out on PS4 and Vita. There just I will seems be to, that. It just seems to be like a shit ton out all of a sudden, and I, I just can't afford it all. Um, I, I get FTL as well. Faster Than Light came out on iPad as well. I kind of want to pick that up. Oh, yeah. Um, I've always wanted to play that. I'll have to have a go on someone's iPad. I'm sure it's not on the Kindle store. Uh, no, I think it is just on iOS. That's the trouble. Like, <laughs> iOS gets a lot of games because I think traditionally it's always been it's always been shown that people on iOS are willing to pay for apps, whereas Android app, uh, users are more willing to accept adverts for a free game. Yeah, but the trouble I can is, understand that. The trouble is you're not going to get, like, I don't think you're going to get full kind of PC ports with adverts in them. No. I think you're more likely to get them at at a reasonable price. I mean, they brought, uh, can you get XCOM on Android? Uh, I'm not on Android, though. I'm on Kindle, which is, like, stripped down. uh, And then the store is far more limited than Kindle than the uh, Android store. Oh, damn. Oh, well. There's some things that I can't get the Facebook app. It's really? Yeah. <laughs> God damn. So what's the Kindle Fire's, like, killer app, then? Uh, you can read books on it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so is it pretty much a Kindle with, like, a few tablet things attached to it? Yeah, than... pretty much. I've All got right. Football Manager. That's well, pretty cool. there you go. What more do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, when we were kids, I was around Matthew's house. Well, Matthew, one of our kind of semi-regulars, he's in a few shows with us. But I remember him, I mean, him having a kind of argument. Cause I, he was playing, like, Football Manager, and I was criticising it. Like, back in the day, when you played a match, it was just a load of, like, numbered dots run, running around a, p- a field rather than, like, a fully-fledged engine in-engine game. 
that's at least when it was getting better. Because I remember, like, even earlier than that, you didn't have any sort of visualization sometimes. Was it just, like, a text readout of what was happening? Yeah, in the sometimes, game? yeah. Yeah, but, I, like, I remember you had one that was little numbered dots running around a pitch. And he was like, I, like, I was saying, Matthew, this is, this is fucking bullshit. <laughs> Why haven't I got a full <laughs> print? And he was like, it's better this way. And I wasn't, like, irritated that he thought it was better. It was just that he, he was adamant that this was better than having an in-engine, like, game running and showing you a match. And I was like, there's no way this is better. Either you either <laughs> skip matches because you, you don't care about the outcome, you just want to get on with the managerial portion, or you watch them in engine, surely that's the best outcome. And, yeah, um, I, just, I, just, I just remember that. <laughs> I half agree with both of you, because if, if you want to sit back and watch the game, watching the numbered dots is shit, but to actually tactically change the game, watching the dots is far easier than looking at a person trying to work out which one he is. Yeah, but it's not like just watching people run around, is it? It's going to have an interface on top of it like FIFA does, surely. Well, it might do now, but when they first brought in the 3D rendered matches, it was shite. Really? Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> everyone looked like a white male with, like, grey, uh, grey brown hair. Jesus. Well, isn't the two, there's Championship Manager and LMA Manager? Uh, there's just Football Manager and Championship Manager, they're the two main ones. All right, because uh, I don't really know. They used to have their own managing game. Oh, really? God. The yeah, so I think there's four or five, but um, Championship Manager uh, split its development in the early 2000s. I thought I thought somebody split off from it, though, and made their own company. It's possible that happened. I'm not exactly sure of the ins and outs. All I know is that one company took the name with them, and the other company took the database. <laughs> and, and everyone thought, oh, God, having the name is the most important thing, but the uh, the customers proved otherwise. Well, yeah, it, uh, if, if your game's going to be shit just because you tie a name to it, people will eventually drip, but yeah, the, I, I, the, the name does mean a lot. Like, if you slap a name, a well-known name on anything, it'll, it'll sell. Um, well, yeah, I mean, Call of Duty's been doing it for franchise, years. franchise, and, like, no one cares, but there's a, it's a name that people recognise, so it still has some value for now. Well, I mean, back in the day, I, I never really play football games, but I remember back in the day when uh, Pro, Pro Evolution Soccer came out, that was like that was miles better as far yeah. as gameplay went than FIFA, and it's only recently in the kind of the last half of the, like the, the 360 PS3 gen yeah. that FIFA's kind of got back on top and, and Pez has kind of fell into obscurity. Yeah, but, no one plays Pro Evolution Soccer anymore. Yeah, uh, it, it kind I of, want to say it was FIFA. It was definitely FIFA 10, but maybe slightly earlier than that when people switched. Um. And now FIFA's got such a brand name. It's because you can have the licenses for the teams in as well. It's rubbish. I, th- I remember Pro Evolution Soccer 5. When they played Sunderland versus Newcastle, it was like um, like the Wearside Warriors versus North Pineside or something because you don't have the real teams. Yeah, so but my, my point was going to be that despite Pro Evolution Soccer being the fucking vastly better game for many years, it never, ever stole the thunder of FIFA purely because of the name. Yeah, I agree. Um but it doesn't matter so much now because FIFA has clawed it back. Although I believe, I've, I've not played it, as I said, I don't really play football games, but I believe FIFA's kind of resting on its laurels again now that's got no real challenge. Yeah, it, well, I think that happens with everything. It's a shame, but that's the problem when you make a game that comes out every year as well. Yeah. <laughs> but we've, been, we've covered that topic many times. Oh, yeah, damn God, yeah. Annualization is <laughs> not, not good for anybody. Uh, but yeah, so we've got quite a bit to, to review tonight. Um, I think on the cards, we've got Titanfall, we've got Infamous Second Sons, we've got uh, Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls. Um, oh, have you, have you got anything else on top of that? Um, I've not played anything. Have we, have, hang on, have we done South Park? No, no, we haven't done South Park. Oh, fuck it, throw, throw that in there. Yeah, you got Stick of Truth to cover as well. So we've yeah, got yeah. four big games to, to cover tonight. Um, so let's say, as soon as it come out first, why don't we go with Stick of Truth first? and elves of Zaron, a great evil has descended upon us. I believe we are facing a threat to our entire world. Our only hope is for our two factions to join forces. Tonight, we are no longer elves, goths, or girls. Tonight, we fight as one! Fuck that. We do not team up with fucking elves. Only good elf is a dead elf. Why don't you suck my elven dick, butters? Um, it's funny, I'll put it that way. It's the first game that actually had me laughing for a, for a long time. Um, 
sticks to the show very realistically, yeah, but to be honest, the gameplay is quite thin, and I imagine if you're not a South Park fan, you're not going to be able to stick with it for very long. All right, so I've, I don't know a lot about Stick of Truth, because honestly, it's not a game I've really kept up with. Because I would say I'm not, I would never describe myself as a fan of South Park. I watch it, and I've seen probably the majority of the episodes, actually, but I don't really, yeah. it's not something I show I tune in and watch and keep up to date with the new series. So I've not really, and, and licensed games are normally pretty shit, and having played licensed South Park games in the past, yeah, I know that they have been pretty shit, but I get the impression that this was one that, well, I mean, it's been fucking getting made for years now. Yeah, well, it, it should have been out a year already. I think it was due for release march last year. Yeah, didn't the publisher um, go under and it all got pushed back. But yeah, I mean, yeah. it's finally out, but I get the impression it took so long because uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone really wanted to get it right. Yeah. Uh, because since, well, from the early days, kind of once South Park hit its stride and started maturing, they've really had a thing about getting things right and being perfectionists. Um, they did it with Team America as well, doing like stupid amount of takes and, and then swearing off never doing a sequel to that just because they aren't a work involved. Yeah. They all seem to like to get well, things done properly. Matt Stone and Trey Parker, uh, I think they're one Oscar away from winning that. Um, they've, got, they've got a Tony Award, they've got an Emmy. Um, they are actually very talented people because oh, they're, they're so focused, yeah, they I think. Yeah, they're very, very good. I mean, they, uh, a testament to their kind of quality, The a few seasons back, it might be quite a few seasons back now, but they did the three-part epic Imagination Land story. Yeah. And I'm it's pretty amazing. sure that used to, that was intended to be, or at least written as maybe possibly a movie. And then they thought, no, yeah. let's not do a movie. Let's just make it a, a, like in the series. Um, so they're, they're quite happy to kind of sacrifice grand <laughs> grand things if they don't think it's going to work out. They've done it later on as well. Um, there was a three-part. Have you seen the episode with the coon? I've seen a few episodes with the coon. In. Yeah. Well, the first episode was like a standalone one in about season 12, but then they did a three-parter in 14, so maybe. Friends. Yeah, Coon and Friends, where he has to fight um, C- Cthulhu. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. And don't they bring back, like, loads of characters from old episodes, like Mecha Streisand and stuff? Yeah, yeah, That's well, uh, it's, I think, the f- oh, I might be getting to it now, but there's, like, a big anniversary episode on, like, that third part or something, like, the building up to it. And uh, it's very good, but I'm sure that was meant to originally as well to be the uh, the third movie, if the, well, what would have been the second movie of Imagination Land. Damn. So they're always quite happy to get something right. Like if if they could get it better right as a TV show, they'd rather do that than spend time making a movie. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. Um, but yeah, so Stick of Truth is essentially from. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong because you you played this. But I tell you what, why don't you you tell us what type of game it is? It's a very basic RPG, and it's got a sort of Final Fantasy turn based style of fighting. But the animation and the environments is completely like flat, like a South Park episode would be. I mean, you can run close to the screen, but you're yeah, it's always got, like... It's kind of like that kind of um, It's kind of like that Street to Rage kind of isometric style. That's, yeah, that's exactly what it is, yeah. And uh, it works very well because it makes you feel like you're right in the show. Um, Plot-wise, it's it's completely original story. You play the new kids who has to come and uh, uh, rescue the stick of truth from certain uh, parties. I'll get into that later. And but then there's this secondary story going on that about the about an alien spaceship that crash lands and causes uh, an outbreak of zombie Nazis. <laughs> as they do, so you've got you know, this, as it happens. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, so the kids are playing this game with a stick of truth. At the same time, there's zombie things going on, and the stories get intertwined and end up both like finishing at the same place. I um, mean, you're like the savior of everyone. Is the Oh, that's written on the box, that's not a spoiler. But um I gotta say it didn't hook me because Second Son came out and I needed some money, I did trade it in before I finished it. Oh really? But yeah. So even like as a huge South Park fan as me, I didn't have that hook or the, that drive to play it to finish it through. Some of the story parts, like the, the missions you play get a little bit stale because as fun as the combat is and it's really good combat and the RPG system is basic but I'd rather have it that way than fucking whatever Final Fantasy XIII did. <laughs> um, but it's still like, oh, you've got to go on this epic quest. Um, the goths need some cigarettes, so you'll get them on our side. And it's like, all right, I'll go and get some cigarettes. And by the time you've unlocked all the fast travel locations, it just makes everything pointless. So um, you don't even... Like, there's not that many areas to explore. 
Yeah, I mean, one thing I've heard about this is that it's a fairly kind of bog standard GRPG style game. As you see, it's about turn based battles. Uh, I, I get the impression that you you have, you've got a, always got a party of characters with you, and that each fill a role. Um, like, is, is Cartman a wizard? Well, the, Cartman is a wizard. He's the leader of the the human clan. But with regards to your party, you unlock party members, but you only ever have one with you at a time. All right. Um, you can switch between them at any time because they've all got different abilities that you can use um, in the environments. Right. Um, but you, you yourself have different range of abilities that you can't have active at one time. It's a bit like Second Son where you have to pick which one you want at the time and you have to wait until you know, you, you, you have to know which one you needed for whatever All right, more. so it, it kind of sounds a bit like, I'm sorry if this kind of <laughs> is a really obscure reference, but it kind of sounds like the old Final Fantasy job system where you can kind of swap your job and it gives you a different role. Uh, that I have not experienced that, but that sounds pretty much spot on. Yeah. So there's uh, there's a range of farts you unlock, and the whole a lot of the game is focused on farting. Um, <laughs> and there's different farts do different things. So there's one time when you have to infiltrate the uh, the army base where the aliens have crashed, and you have to use your like ninja fart, and you sort of you go where uh, guards can't see you. And you fart, and then you control the fart as it moves across the screen. Oh, and right. then uh, <laughs> explode it when you want, and it'll distract them, and you have to get past them. So there's a lot of... Um, which Final Fantasy could take a note of from Final Fantasy XIII. There's a lot of things you can do in the environment that actually affect the game. So it's, there's a lot of puzzle elements as well. All right. I've seen a bit where... Uh, I've seen a demo where they're attacking an elf stronghold to rescue somebody. Mm-hmm. And when the like the fact like when they're trying to escape, uh, one of the friends kind of pokes their head through the window at uh, the basement window, and he's, he's dropping things on them from a height. Have you seen that bit, or am I just come talking with a fucking bollocks? It's like no, it's, go, go on, go on. <laughs> but, uh, and basically, the, the, the friend who was dropping things on their head it was kind of helping you fight these kind of waves of elves who were attacking you. Yes, I believe I remember that. That's yes. I, I don't know, it's a demo I watched ages ago, but so there's loads of like environmental things you can use as well as your own abilities. Yeah. Um, with regards to Cartman being a wizard, so he never actually joined your party. He's the leader of one clan and he recruits you for the first half of the game. And then you start working for the elves who were led by um, Stan and Kyle. <laughs> and you can't use them either. Oh no, hang on, you do get Stan. But you're the... Um, your other companions is uh, Jimmy the Bard, Kenny the Princess, and um, <laughs> Bud the Paladin. Oh, that's took, amazing. The first, uh, the first half of what I played, because I said I didn't finish it, was so much more entertaining than the second half. It was once you've been around and you've done anything, it's, it's, it gets a little repetitive. Oh, really? When you're first like, walking around, it's like you're in Southwark. I mean, I was so taken in by this. I tweeted at Obsidian. They tweeted back. I changed my Facebook profile picture. But I would not have done any of those things in the second half of what I played because it was just a bit. Oh, I'll just—it was just a bit of an inconvenience to play it. Like I'll fast travel here, I'll buy this, I'll fast travel back. Kind and, of just busy work rather than actual quests. Yeah, because I mean, what what could they do with some kids? I mean, I'd rather it be a bit more imagination-y, like the epic nature of the return of the two towers to the Fellowship Video Store episode. Oh, that I fucking love that episode so Actually much. Go on an epic quest. But I didn't get a sense of that throughout this at any point. And yeah, it felt, at times it was just, they the put busy work in just to pad it out. And I'd rather have had proper story related missions. I've got, I've got to ask. Uh, no, I, I believe, if memory says, this was developed by Obsidian? Yeah. How buggy is it? I've not noticed any bugs. Oh, um, fucking hell, really? One, one time, uh, my screen was a bit jittery, and apparently a lot of people have been finding that, but it only happened to me once in the sort of seven hours I played. All right, okay. No, I, five I, hours. But that, that's actually, not like, a, that honestly sounds, like, su I'm surprised that you say that, because I don't think I've played on a, an Obsidian game that was either polished or not buggy. Like, they either finish a game and it's full of bugs, or they, they kind of get the feeling that load of content had to be prematurely scrapped so they could finish it. <laughs> I do get the impression that that might be the case. <laughs> Oh, really? Well, it's yeah. Very thin on the ground. Like, there's so few... Um, like, you don't get any real character development um, through your, like, evolution arc. 
there's only four moves you can power up and you can't even power all four of them up all the way. Oh, right. Um, the amount of outfits that there is is shockingly low. Some some levels don't even have their own like full sets of anything. So, so like, like there was one a lot of... when I was about level six and it was just like all the next stuff I could find was level nines and above. So I was like, well, I'm going to have this for the most part until, you know, yeah, so like the there's no rats. random drops, everything's programmed and... Say that you've been playing Diablo, man. Now, uh, now everything needs exactly. uh, to be randomised. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this, um, there's a trash system where there's loads of junk, which is related to the show. And after you pick up your first like five bits of trash, and you're like, oh, that's Jimmy's crutch. That's amazing. Or you know, that's is it, Miss Slave's is, dildo. Is it just fucking like references for the sake of them? Yeah, it's just, but there's so many, it's just like, every time you open a bag or a chest or loot a corpse, you get about five to ten pieces of trash. And, you know, in an RPG, all you do is looting things. The EU, there is too much trash compared to actual useful stuff. <laughs> and you can sell all trash for money, and it just, money then becomes pointless, because it's like, nothing's more than $15, and I've got 300 Oh, really? So there's not enough. That's the thing. I mean, it's a difficult thing to balance out, but I think yeah. RPGs tend to need money sinks. So you actually have something to put your money on and a purpose for, like, grinding money and gaining money in the, like as you go through the game. So if you just have a surplus, it becomes, as you say, it becomes pointless. And if you never have any, you kind of forget about it because you never have any. So it's a difficult balancing act. But uh... It is. But then they've shot themselves in the foot because most of the best weapons and army you get, you actually get, like, as soon every time you rank up with... A certain faction, not not necessarily your personal level, but every time you complete like a quest tree, it's like, oh, now you are uh, a noble warrior rather than just a regular warrior. You'll get a noble warrior set of clothes for free, and it's better than anything you could have bought up to that point. All oh, right, so the actual clothes are they're not just like kind of aesthetic items; they're actually your armor and gear that you. Yeah, wear. there's armor and it's, um, and you know that's what I mean. So the actual system's quite robust. So there's helmets, chest pieces. Um, trousers, gloves, and then you've got uh, everyone has a ranged and a melee weapon, and you can attach like modules to each one to sort of give them stat boosts or um, you know thingy drains on other players. All right, yeah. But the problem is there's not enough of the stat boosty things, and there's not enough of the weapony armory things. There's there's only so many combinations. All oh, right. It just gets a bit dull. It sounds like it's kind of from what I've heard, it, it, it's a very good South Park product but it's a kind of very it's a fairly mediocre game on grpg yeah um not that we get a whole lot of kind of grpg style games over in the west anymore like we get final fantasy and then maybe another obscure one a year and, and i will say that do very well. the fighting system goes beyond just a normal turn-based thing as well so depending on the formation of the enemies you have to do different things so you can't get a melee person if there's someone stood in front of them oh, that's pretty um, good and there's different stances, so it's like, oh, he's blocking. That means only ranged attacks will work on him. So you have to really know what your, um, what like how it works. It's quite complex in that regard, and I would uh, be happy if it like people took parts of the fighting style and put it into other JRPGs in the future because it's far more entertaining than anything I've played before. Um, and it's like the, honestly, the fighting was the best part of it. Normally in JRPGs. After like the fifth grind, you just end up running. Yeah, you play for the story, don't you? You know, like I, that's what I normally find the fantasy games. I end up playing for the story rather than the actual gameplay because you're right. Other than the kind of cinematic boss battles, a lot of the kind of randomized battles and such are just a bit of a grind. Yeah, well, not, not this one, it's not, the story's good, but it would have worked maybe worked better just as a TV show, um, like maybe a two-part or something. But the fighting style was so good that I didn't get bored of that. So there was enough to sort of keep me ticking along for a good while. And I reckon I would have finished it if Second Son hadn't been coming out. All right, fair enough. Now, just one question before we move on to your kind of yeah. final verdict. Is uh, is Randy in this game? And it, it, how how much is he in this game? Randy plays the main character in the Alien storyline. So you interact with Cartman most in the kids' Stick of Truth storyline. And you interact with Randy the most in the Alien storyline because... You both get kidnapped by aliens at the same time. Ah, oh, right. And you both have to escape um, alien captivity together, and then you sort of have a bond of friendship. And um, every time you bump into him on the street, he just starts saying really inappropriate things to you, like reminding you how good friends you are and stuff. <laughs> and um, I fucking love Randy. Like, he's, I think he's my favourite character. 
like yeah, there, there's a town meeting one day, and you run into interrupt it as a like for another mission you're doing, and Randy's hosting it, and he's like, "Oh, hey, everyone, I just want to introduce my uh, special friend, <laughs> the new kid. We have a really <laughs> close bond. He comes over all the time." <laughs> oh Jesus! And he, it's it is funny, and Stan is great. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. What no, what's it in? Randy, Randy, sorry, Randy is great, but that's the. I feel like a lot of humour was lost because it seems to be the Randy anal probe sequence is the one that was cut for Europeans. Yeah, I thought we got it though. Um, I, not if you buy it on console. Oh right, it, oh, it's just the PC version, is it? Yeah. Oh, that's bullshit, man. It's really weird how they've locked it off. I, I'm not understanding what they've done. So, America and Asia, I think, get everything. Europe gets the anal probe stuff on PC, and Australia obviously gets nothing. <laughs> the Australians will be used to it by now, though. Yeah. I don't <laughs> understand why they've, why they've done all, but um, there's little title cards that are put up in its place, and for them, like, as far as they can be, they are entertaining, because the whole point is, and I can't be spoiling this because you're not allowed to see it in the game, but you you manage to get free, and Randy's, like, giving you inst- He's still tied up on the anal probe device, and you're going around, and he's like, all right, no, that's that's the lever I saw an alien press it earlier to get out, and you press it, and you get anally probed. <laughs> and uh, it happens about six or seven times, <laughs> and every time it happens, there's this, like this blue title card flashes up and a little bit of text. And by the time you get to the fifth one, it's like, okay, Europe, you've probably realised that this is an ongoing joke and it's not going to get any better for you. <laughs> That's pretty good, that I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so they do take the piss out of themselves, or they're taking the piss out of. I'm guessing it was the distributors. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah, it'll probably be, I don't know, probably on the publisher. Although, I don't know, it'll probably just be the, the ratings board or something. It's probably been censored because of Germany, normally, you find. Yeah, I think, it, I think it is, yeah. Although, I've got to say, UK is normally tread separate from the rest of mainland Europe. Yeah, I've never heard this before. Some like There's normally a divide. Sometimes we end up having stricter like rules on a game than the rest of Europe. But you're right, we are normally tread separately. He's a he's a fucking a very kind of almost philosophical question, right? When did like Europe and Britain become le- more restrictive than America for its reasons? Yeah, I know. Like, I when I was a kid, I always remember games getting banned in America, but still being available over here. Yeah, and especially on down the down the sexual content line because America's traditionally very um, reserved when it comes to sex, but quite open about violence. Yeah, because you know that's. The best way to be. <laughs> it's alright to fucking blow someone's head off as long as you don't fuck them. Well, is that, I can't remember what show it is, but I think it might be like Walking Dead and there was like a, a zombie's nipple on display. <laughs> they were like, you can't have that. And they're like, alright, we'll pierce it with a spike and have blood pouring out. And they're like, yeah, that's fine. Jesus. Like, it the, is. the producers did it as a joke and then the board was like, no, we're fine with that. Jesus. Yeah, I can, I can completely see that happening. But, uh... So, to have it this way around for South Park where Europe is sexually repressed. God, we're, 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 it's the continent that has Amsterdam. I mean, let's face it, though. There's not, I mean, it's not a great deal. That's Okay, it's jokingly sexual, but it's not like sexual violence, is it? I mean, it's a fucking cartoon, for God's sake. I, I, honestly, because I haven't seen it, I'm not sure if I've, it's online. I'm getting, guessing it is. But it can't be any worse than anything that's been in the TV show, and that's shown everywhere. Exactly. You know, this has but... been far worse. Indiana Jones gets raped by George Lucas in that. That's much be worse than Jesus. nearly. He Robert gets King. raped by him like three or four times yeah. in different kind of <laughs> mock-ups of famous film rape scenes. <laughs> like what's that one with Jodie Foster, The Accused, where she gets raped on the pinball yeah. machine? <laughs> 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 Fucking hell, man! Yeah, I just—I uh, mean, that's probably on telly tonight. They show like four South Park was... episodes a night on TV. So uh, yeah, never mind. So, yeah. what would your kind of verdict be? Would you would you would you recommend this as a full price purchase, or what's your opinion? Um, well, I, I'll give you two answers. I am a South Park fan, and even though I didn't finish it, I don't begrudge paying the full price. I only paid thirty five pounds for it. it well, I was going to say, if you bought this on PC, I think on release you could still get it for about twenty twenty five quid. So it was I yeah. mean, straight away you could pick it up at a reasonable price. And I can't imagine it would require a beefy PC platform to, yeah. to run seen as it's literally and just a South Park episode. Since I was going to, we were talking about Obsidian games being buggy, this is probably the simplest game they've made. Like, even going back to uh, the buggiest game I remember, Knights of the Old Republic 2. Um, I never thought that was buggy. It was just completely unfinished. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, they did Fallout New Vegas, which was buggy. 
Yeah. But this is simpler in all regards compared to that, so I wouldn't expect there to be any bugs, but you never know with them. But yeah, I, I'm, I don't begrudge paying full price, and I, maybe it's because it's a simple game, but maybe it's because the new consoles have brought the price down. But um, maybe for non-South Park fans, it's a Steam sale, or you know, a second-hand pickup maybe, but it's definitely worth a go for anyone who you know, has ever dabbled in that world. Yeah, so kind of, I suppose, if, if you're a South Park fan or in the mood for a GRPG-style game, fair to say? If you're in the mood for a JRPG style game that's not going to have you playing for 50 plus hours, then yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be a fucking refreshing change, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, exactly, so... I mean, I, the reason we are recording this show like a week late, later than we anticipated is because I was away on, on a business trip and I took my Vita with us and I started playing Final Fantasy VIII. Oh, yeah. And I played that for so long and got nowhere. Yeah, that I can happen. Seen, Jesus Christ, how did I... I've played through this game like three times. How how the fuck did I do that? I just got like I just got sick of it. I can't do JRPGs anymore. Well, that's what I, I tried to play Final Fantasy IX. I had an emulator on my phone. I know Naughty Naughty, but I will buy it again on the Vita. Um, and Jesus, it takes you an hour, and you haven't even like tapped the first place. <laughs> it's, and it's only going to get longer, more drawn out, and more difficult after this. I know. It's, Whereas uh, South Park, by the time you're in an hour, you're like level five, you've got some gear, you know the crack. Yeah, I need to be rewarded these days. I've been spoiled by like MMOs and shit. I need the, yeah. I need the high of that level ding and all the rest of it. But uh, I think that's possibly why GRPGs have kind of lost lost prominence in the West, you know, because once upon a time, they were, they were kind of very strategic, kind of very, you know, in-depth RPGs that you didn't really get in Western games. You know, there was a lot yeah. of number crunching and a lot of kind of tweaking of specs and stats. And then on the flip side, you actually got a really involved, really deep story, which, again, you didn't really get in many other games. But nowadays, you have games like The Last of Us delivering, like, you know, really good stories, uh, like Bioshock Infinite. But on the flip side, you have, like, MMOs throwing stats at you constantly, but rewarding you constantly. I mean, if you play World yeah. of Warcraft for an hour, you'll be, like, level 10. You'll be feeling like a badass going from like a fucking somebody who's sitting in just nothing but pants in a field to somebody who's got like a proper suit, suit of armor and's got some badass abilities in like inside an hour. Whereas Final Fantasy, you might have named your main character. And you know what? Like, I think if you go back and look at a lot of Final Fantasy storylines, they're not that good. No. <laughs> when I say in South Park that they throw like busybody quests at you in the middle of the game. Final Fantasies do that, you just don't realise because the busybody quests are so long. Yeah. That <laughs> it's like, oh, we need to go and talk to this guy because he's got some vital information. It'll take you three hours to get there and get back. <laughs> it's like travelling in real time in their world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, I, I don't know, man. But uh, So, Stick of Truth is, like, you know, you recommend it for, it's a full price buy for South Park fans, but for maybe people just looking to play a decent RPG, get it at a discount. Yeah, if if anyone just wants something light as well, it was yeah. a, a refreshing break from sort of the heavy. <laughs> Even just the visuals, it was nice to have something so simple before I dived in there. Maybe that's why Infamous looks so good, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think everyone should have a go on it. It's a lot of fun. Even if you just give it a few hours, I'm sure you'll laugh a few times and it'll be worth I, it. So. I, I do want to pick it up. I'm probably going to pick it up at a Steam sale, like you said. Yeah. Um, again, it was just a game that kind of got lost in the mix. Yeah, I, everyone. Has, I, you've got to have priorities when there's so many games come out at once. Yeah, man, it could just. Uh, <laughs> I was laughing actually because uh, there's a. I think it's quite an old meme. Like it's kind of like a rage comic thing, but uh, it's kind of like a four panel thing, and it's like, uh, you know, it's like going out. I've got no money. It's like I need new clothes. I've got no money. And then at the bottom, it's got like video games, and then next to it, it's just got a picture of Donald Trump. <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> Jesus Christ, that hits fucking far too close to home. <laughs> yeah. It really like if, I, if I don't have like big blocks of moon free cash, and someone says, hey, you want to go out? I'll go, ah, I've got no money because I hate going out and having to like watch my cash. I just like to go out and kind of spend what I need to. But yeah. like if I want a video game, suddenly I'm fucking like I'm an accountant. <laughs> I've got like funds coming in from everywhere and I'm doing tax breaks and shit because I'll have that game but uh, I thought that was great. The way I looked at it was um, you, I probably build it into my sort of monthly expenditure. Like, Oh yeah, I definitely do. 
in the same way that my TV license, my internet, my phone bill, my rent, and my video games allowance. It, <laughs> video game money is not part of your disposable income. It's part of your essentials income. <laughs> That's what it feels like for me, actually. Yeah. Do I do I buy petrol? Or do I buy a new <laughs> game? Um, yeah, I thought that that fucking meme though. I was laughing my head at it just because it hits so close to home. It was yeah. ridiculous. You have done well, Horadrum. Your service here is finished. And you should all... Run. Malfail. Right, so what do you want to move on to now then? Um, you to, since you're talking about leveling up within, you know, an hour to level ten, should we talk about Diablo? Yeah, let's get let's get out of the way. So, oh God, it's it's been about <laughs> it's been just under two weeks uh, since Reaper of Souls, uh, the first expansion pack for Diablo three, launched on the PC. Um, of course, it's coming to PS4 as well at an unknown time later this year, it's assumed. But uh, for now, they're focusing on the PC release now. I I really liked Diablo. I really liked it when it came on the PC. I th- I think I liked it so much because the core gameplay is really slick. The combat feels great. You feel very powerful. All the classes are fun to play, and it was just a, you know it was a good time. I, I think Blizzard are great at making kind of constantly rewarding RPGs. Like the World of Warcraft's the first MMO to really m- mass appeal because it was so rewarding to play. And Diablo almost condenses that down to a science. Yeah, and. I mean, there were legitimate complaints about the original Diablo 3. Its, its end game loot system was a bit all over the place. You had to rely on the auction house and trade and um, gear to get more powerful. Like The loot system was so kind of spread out that the chances of you getting a high level bit of gear to get you more powerful were almost nil. So you basically used to just end up grinding gold and buying it. And it wasn't really fun because, I mean, you're still getting the gear, but buying it's not the same as finding it in the wild. You don't yeah. get that high. But uh, like, regardless of that, uh, just before Reaper Source launched, they launched uh, Patch 2.0, which completely overhauled the game. They closed the auction house. Uh, the loot system was completely overhauled. It brought smart drops to the PC version, which was something they actually put in the PS3 and Xbox 360 versions, which essentially means that 95% of the loot that drops to your character will be geared towards your character. So if you're playing as a barbarian you will get strength gear 95% of the time. If you're playing as a wizard, you'll get intelligence gear 95% of the time. So it means that you're more likely to get an upgrade than just some piece of shit you're going to scrap for money, which was great. But it also introduced something called Loot 2.0, which completely overhauled the stats on things. So instead of just kind of making numbers bigger and bigger, it actually has lots of fun effects. Like um, early on, I got a um, a sword that had like something like a 20% chance to summon a ghostly goat minion to help fight fight with me. (laughs) Uh, so I'd have this like, kind of big goat monster following me around all the time. And just like I've got, at the moment, uh, I've got some boots that uh, leave a trail of fire behind me and burn enemies who kind of That's chase cool. me down. And there's just loads of little fun things like that. You've even got uh, little stats that kind of um, reduce the, the cost or up the damage of certain abilities, which also go to kind of encouraging you to change your spec. So like an ability you never liked might suddenly become unbelievably powerful because of this bit yeah. of gear increasing it. And it encourages you to change up all the time. And it's just a lot more interesting. But that, that that's just the patch. That That's a free patch that if you buy Diablo 3 vanilla on PC, you get this patch as part of the deal with it. So it's right off the bat, it's a much better game. But then Reaper Souls dropped. <laughs> and, oh my God, it's so fucking good. It's like crack good. <laughs> I, uh, I was off when it dropped. And yeah. I think our servers unlocked at uh, 11 p.m. UK time because they, they follow, well, it was basically 12 midnight uh, Central Eastern, well, Central European time. So I, I was on 11 a.m. and I sat from 11 a.m. till 6 a.m. <laughs> fucking playing the uh, the expansion pack. And I basically, I, I picked the new class, the Crusader, who were fucking yeah. awesome. And I basically leveled them up through the, the base game and got to the beginning of the expansion pack chapter. And I was like, right then, I can't finish this in a single sitting. I'm going to bed. And I slept for three <laughs> hours and then came back on it. it That's was, class. 
And like, I think as I forced myself to go to bed, I was sitting there looking out my window and the sun was rising. I was thinking, shit, I should really go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and oh man, it was so much fun. It was fucking ridiculous. Mm-hmm. The thing is as well, I uh, I was leveling up through the base game. I thought, ah, it's always quicker with it if you have a few people. So I opened the game to the public. And there was just nothing but Crusaders everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I played with another par- person who wasn't a Crusader for about a week. And Well, uh, yeah, it, the Crusaders looked badass because they were... I think, did we not play... Did we not play Diablo 3 the night before you bought it? Uh, and, uh, I think or the day before the, the night before you bought it? I think it came... I think it was like two when you years before the setting up some sort of downloady thing at the time. You were downloading the patch. Yeah, I think so. I think you know, I just bought the uh, expansion pack um, on the night, and I was like, I think I applied it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, hold on. There's some, there's some, um, some... But they had, when I was picking my character, you could see the Crusader, and I was annoyed that I couldn't pick it. Yeah, man. It, uh, oh, the it Crusader terrific. Are... So, where does he fit in with regards, because obviously the Warriors, your big brute, your big damage dealer, where does, what does Crusaders fit in as? Well, the Crusaders are kind of like your typical kind of knight in shining armor, except their armor's not really shining. They're more battered and brutal as if they've been through the war. Um, and they're very, uh, like, uh, at first glance, they're very defensive because they, they generally come equipped with a huge shield. And every class in the game always has a bit of gear that's specific to them. Like, barbarians can use things called mighty weapons, which are just, like, vicious-looking things, and those, and mighty belts, which are huge fucking belts they can wear. Uh, wizards can use wands. Uh, witch doctors use ceremonial daggers and, and shit like that. So the, the Crusaders kind of staple gear are Crusader shields, which are kind of full body kite shields that are used for smashing yeah. people in the face. And they also use flails, like basically ball and chain weapons that they just swing into crowds awesome. and smash people in the face. And they just feel like, they just feel like a tank kind of carting around the battlefield, <laughs> throwing themselves into monsters and just crushing them. And my favorite ability on any class is the shield bash. Now, a lot of people don't like it, but it's just so satisfying. And basically, you just sprint at an enemy and smash them full force in the face, and they tend to just go flying. Um, I love the Crusader. I've played it so much. Because um, um, my favorite ability, even though it's not massively powerful in Mass Effect 3 multiplayer, was the uh, the shield charge. It's, it's, I can understand how you think it's fun. Yeah, it's satisfying just the, the crunch and and the uh, if you spec it, it, you get different runes to put on your shield bash ability. And one of them's um, you'll hit your shield, and it kind of throws off like an energy, like a, a wave of holy light into a group. But there's another oh, yeah. wave. Uh, there's another rune, sorry, that splits. Like once it does its initial wave, that other wave splits off into like four mini waves, and it just crushes groups all at once and burns them up in holy fire. It's just really, really fun. I mean, Christ, I played like seven hours straight as this class, and I never once got bored. Um, so yeah, the Crusader is fucking amazingly good fun. In fact, I've barely touched any other class since since it came out. Um, yeah. I'm enjoying the shit out of it. But on top of the Crusader, um, what else do you get? You get uh, a whole other act set after the conclusion of Diablo. Uh, it's Act 5, and it's by far the best act. It's set in a, a city, largely set in a city called Westmarch, which is uh, overrun by reapers, basically spirits who have come to steal steal the souls of everybody there. And they're led Sounds by cool. uh, they're led by an angel called Malfail, who used to be the leader of the like the good angels, and he he disappeared for years and ended. He's reemerged as the angel of death, and he's trying to destroy all of human all of humanity by stealing the souls. Um, so basically you're fighting his armies and there's just loads of kind of these weird spectral fallen angels with huge scythes. They're like, you're walking down the street and there'll be loads of Westmarch citizens cowering in fear, getting the souls ripped for them and turning them into like uh, skeletal warriors that come after you and stuff. And it's really, really gothic and dark. And there's one thing that I never got with the first, uh, the vanilla game, but the music's really, really atmospheric and brooding and it's just really, really fun. And to add to all that as well, there's a ton of fucking, like, little side dungeons everywhere. Like, there's basements. You can go to houses on the street and the little side dungeons, and all of them have kind of interesting little stories to them. There's a, as you go through the, the kind of initial chapter of this act, there's a, there's a subplot where loads of people are starting to rebel against the king of Westmarch because they feel that like he's abandoned them in their time of need. And it's like this political intrigue and you keep stumbling upon groups who are planning to assassinate them and stuff. <laughs> um, and it's just like, that's just like a tiny little plot, but it's, it's just adds to the atmosphere and it's, it's, it's really good. But on top of all these, uh, like the amount of dungeons, the size of them is fucking ridiculous. 
like previously, I think the longest you would ever spend clearing a dungeon was maybe 15 minutes. I think I was trapped in a dungeon yeah. for about 40 minutes at one point. I was going around clearing it all out, and it was just chock full of monsters, and it was so much fun. It just was really, really satisfying to finish. I think, actually, I got so much gear, I had to return to town, like, twice through the clearing well, of it, and I've never had to do that. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was just really, really good. And um, the boss fights as well. The boss fights in the original Diablo were kind of... They were never, like, great. They were always okay. I think there was a few good ones. Um, kind of Belial, who was one of the major lords of hell, you fight halfway through the vanilla game. He was pretty good. Um, Diablo was okay. But the boss fights in this are much better. They're more akin to um, bosses from World of Warcraft that require strategy and tactics and being constantly on your toes. Um, they're very varied, and some of them hit like fucking trucks. You've got to be really careful. And in particular, the last boss, uh, Malthea, the Angel of Death, he is frighteningly difficult. Like I, I, I was playing on normal just to level up the first time I went through it. I was kind of cruising my way through the game. Not really being bothered by anything. I had a couple of good fights, but most of the time I was just smashing enemies for the fun of it. And I got to him, and he really, really fucked me over. I had to be very, very careful. And it was a surprise. Um, and it's it's the, the, the boss fights are, are miles better than anything you get in vanilla, uh, which was a pleasant surprise. Um, so you get the new class, you get the new act, you get uh, the, the kind of loot 2.0 and the smart drops. Um, you've got all the retooled abilities for all the classes, so now specs can be more varied. Um, I think I was reading, actually, since Reaper of Souls' launch, uh, there's a website that used to keep track of the specifications for each class most people are using. And before, something like uh, the, the, the most used spec was accounted for 5% or so around about 5% of all players. Now... There's no one spec that accounts for more than 1% of all players. So there's a far greater degree of variation on how people are playing with each class now. And uh, that, that's that's really good. Um, yeah. So I like yeah. it when um, they, they do it the right way when they sort of entice you to play the game in a different way rather than forcing it upon you to switch. Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've got my Crusader at level 70 now, which is the new cap. That's what you I mean. Sorry, I didn't mention, but you get 10 extra levels to go through um, now. And... I think I, st- I had two specs when I was leveling because as you level, you get new abilities. But since I hit the cap, I think I've gone through six different specs just because I was getting bored and I just wanted to change them up. Yeah. And some of them don't work. Some of them some of them work fucking fantastically. But, you know, they're all good fun. Um, there's actually, with the Crusader, I actually got one spec I'd never been able to try because there was no class who really could do it before. But I was just doing a pure, like, tanking spec. So basically, I couldn't really dish out much damage. But the more damage I took the more I would dish out. So I was basically encouraging things to hit me. <laughs> yeah. um, and basically every time I... I had an ability that every time I attacked something, it increased my chance to block with my shield to almost certain block. So every time something hit me, the next time something else would hit me, I'd block it. And I'd explode in a cloud of fire in response. <laughs> so you just stand in the middle of a huge crowd and block and explode and kill everything with their own damage, essentially. It uh, it was it was kind of cool. Uh, something a bit different. Um but on top of the on top of that, you also when you finish the game, you get something called you get a complete new mode. Because one of the big complaints for the original game was that the storyline isn't great, and I've got to say it's it's pretty it's pretty bog standard again in this one. The voice acting's a bit better, and it's not quite silly, but it's it's the story on ain't gonna blow you away. But uh, one of the major complaints was you had to go through the same story levels all over and over again. It was the same enemies over and over again in the same places. And, you know, there's a little bit of randomization, but you're always going to find zombies in, in the first act. And you're always going to find cultists in the second act and, you know, all that shit. But uh, when you complete the game, you get a new mode called Adventure Mode, which basically doesn't restrict you to any one area. It opens the entire game to you and you can teleport fairly freely around it. And in each of the acts areas, there's five bounties. And these bounties can be, go and kill this monster, go and kill this boss, go and trigger this event, go and clean this shrine, or go and like loot this specific chest. And you basically have to go to that area and complete the bounty, and you get extra experience, and you level up and everything from uh, from them. And basically, it's complete. It's, it's just a huge amount of randomization. Um, it's far more than you ever get in the story mode. But, I mean, again, you're always going to be fighting the like, the enemies who belong in that area, but the placements are a lot more varied, and there's a lot more of them as well. The fights are a lot bigger, and they're a lot harder. And you get a lot more yeah. elites and champion packs sent at you, um, which is which is good. But the kind of real 
fun bit of it is as you complete bounties you get these things called rift keystones which if you combine five and five of those you get to open something called the nephilim rift and these nephilim <laughs> rifts are completely randomized dungeons so they can be any portion of the game with any kind of weather or lightning effects applied to them to change up their atmosphere and then any kind of enemy so you're going to get enemies from act five fighting with enemies from act two and it's going to be a complete clusterfuck basically and because some of these enemies were never designed to work with each other, when you get certain pairings, they're fucking awful. They're, their abilities just complement each other so well that you'll end up getting fucked. And it's really fun. It's so chaotic. It, you never yeah, know what you're going to get. Um, it just encourages you to get good at the, the combat. You're not just kind of going through the motions. And there's even some kind of silly ones because in the base game there was a hidden level called Whimsy Shire, which is basically a rainbow-filled paradise filled, uh, filled with teddy bears and unicorns. Okay. Uh, they can even be thrown into these Nephilim rifts. <laughs> um, so I'm guessing think... you've, um, you've been through one and had a... Oh, yeah, I've been through loads. Um, I think the, the trouble is, what, what I'm finding now is that um, I've got... Because everybody gets uh, rift keystones for completing bounties, that every time you complete a, like, a, a set of bounties, you have enough rift, uh, rift keystones to do, like five or six rifts between a party of four. And nobody really oh, wants to stay around too much for that for that many. So I've got a ton of rift keystones, and I just never get the chance to use them. Um, it's in a party where someone else uses theirs. Yeah, so you're like you're, you're right. basically saying in the chat like, "Hey, anyone want to do a rift?" And then somebody will walk over and go, "Right then, I've just opened one." And you think, "Oh well, shit! I'll, I'll just put my eighty away, shall I?" Um, <laughs> but the, the kind of the point of these rifts is that there'll be a bar on the side of the screen, and as you kill enemies, it fills up with blood. And when you fill it with blood, uh, you summon a Rift Warden, who is the, kind of the end boss. And there'll be kind of, there's a set list of different Raid Wardens, so you'll, you, you kind of get a bit of repetition. But these are kind of super versions of other bosses and other hard monsters you'll fight throughout the story mode. So you can get kind of um, a boss called Gorm, who in the story mode, he was the Lord of Gluttony. And he basically belches out acidic acids all over the place. And he's got like mouths and stomachs all over the place. And you can kind of get a souped up version of him spawning in and loads of little little bits and pieces as well. Um, so there's a lot a lot, lot going on in the rifts. Um, and adventure mode's a great way to kind of play after you've finished with the story because you don't have to sit through the kind of silly dialogue um, or go through the motions. You can go wherever you want. And it's just uh, a lot of fun. And I also believe that if you play on the higher difficulties in bounties, there's extra um, kind of high-level loot. So the legendary items and some additional legendary items get thrown into the mix to encourage you to do it. So Yeah, that does sound good because it's one of them games where, I don't know, I'd almost feel you feel empty by not playing it, I guess. Yeah. But you also don't want to play go over ground you've already walked. So this adventure mode like the perfect way to continue your experience. Yeah, it's really good. And what I like about it is that uh, the bounties themselves, are very, you can do them very quickly, but you can also kind of yeah. go wander off the beaten track and do a few bits and pieces extra. And if you get sick of an act, just jump to another one. It, it, it's no thing. You know, you've got, uh, what, what is, you've got 25 bounties in every game. There's five in each act. And if you get sick of them, just fucking log out and log into a new game and you'll get fresh bounties generated for you. So there's, oh, there's a lot great. of variation going on. Um, I can see Adventure Mode being the kind of what keeps this going for, for many, many months to come, many years to come even. It's, uh, it's I imagine it's where you're going to spend most of your time now unless you start a new character. Yeah, that's the thing. You can't take, as far as I'm aware, you can't take a character into Adventure Mode until you've finished all five acts. Yeah, makes um, sense. I'm not sure if you just finish it with one character, if you can play Adventure Mode with any character. I'm not sure if that's the case. I think you have to finish the game with every character, which is fine because Adventure yeah. Mode isn't kind of just some kind of random mode off to the side. It actually is set, as far as story goes, after the conclusion of Reaper of Souls. You kind of just... you need to be tooled up as well. Uh, yeah, you know, it's like everything scales to your level now, but it's Adventure Mode's obviously done with level 70 in mind, the level cap. Uh, everything's yeah. geared towards it there, so it's it is it is really good though. Um, it's excellent, but yeah, I mean, Reaper Souls has been out maybe two weeks. Um, I must have, oh god, I must have a stupid amount of time. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I have like 48 hours worth of time already on it. I uh, would not be surprised either, considering you had nearly 24 in the first 24 hours. Yeah, it's fucking crazy. I've I've spent so much time on it. Um, I got my I got my crusade at level seventy inside a week, um, inside a few days to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've also started playing around with uh, other features. Oh, one one other feature you get with the expansion pack is you get a new um, a new crafter. 
So in the base game, you had the blacksmith who created gear and armor, uh, weapons and armor, sorry, and then you had the jeweler who could uh, socket gems and create new gems to make you more powerful. Well, in this one, uh, in Reaper of Souls, you meet, uh, when you play through Act 5, you meet a mystic. You sail her from some reapers to, who are trying to steal a soul, and she agrees to help you. And she offers two services. The first one is enchanting. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's it's really good. It's 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 not like uh, kind of what I I anticipated it be. I thought you would take a bit of gear and make it more powerful by adding stuff to it. But instead, what it is is you can pick one of the stats on this bit of gear and roll a random selection from a fixed list. So say you've got um, a bit of gear that I don't know ups your strength by six hundred. You don't want strength. You can click on it and it'll pick from a, a predetermined list of alternative stats, and it'll pick two of them and say. Do you want either of these, or do you want to keep the original uh, strength? And you might get lucky, and you might get something that's more usable, but basically it acts as both a way to improve gear and also a bit of a money sink, because if you get a yeah. roll of a stat that isn't useful, you're going to have to do it again. So it's a money Clever. sink that can encourage you to, to, to grind more gold and gather more materials, uh, while also allowing you to alter gear and make it more suitable. It's, it's a great system, and she's very, yeah. very useful. But again, it is a huge money sink. So you do need to keep uh, grinding. I had, I think, 25 million gold when I first started Reaper of Souls. I'm down to 16 million now. <laughs> so it's, Sounds uh, like a lot of gold. Yeah, it's not, nothing's cheap at level 70, it would seem. Um, but the second service she offers is a, a service called Transmodification or Mogification. And basically it allows you to take a bit of gear and apply a different look to it. So instead of walking around with randomly strewn together bits of gear... You can actually match sets and change gear to how you like uh, like them to look. All right, that sounds is, interesting. Yeah, it's quite nice because um, I quite like. There was a couple of sets of armor for the Crusader I really liked, and then some I really didn't. So if I got a set I didn't like, I just changed it back to one I did. <laughs> All right, actually, yeah. Um, and you can also do it with their uh, weapons as well. Um, and how it works is that. The way gear works in, in Diablo is like the different level brackets. So say gear, gear that's one level one to level ten will have a certain look, and then level 11 to level 20 will have another look. As you level up a character, you'll unlock these kind of brackets in the trans, trans, excuse me, trans modification. So if you've got yeah, a level so 60... Yeah, you just apply a different skin. Yeah, so if, when I started, I had a level 60 barbarian, so he'd unlocked level 1 to 60 bracket in looks, so I could apply all of them to my Crusader armor. And then when I leveled from 61 to 70, I unlocked the two armor sets that were for those. But you can also unlock legendary looks by picking up that legendary. So every time you pick up a legendary, you unlock that kind of character, that skin for that weapon as a trans transmogrification right. option. So if you get a legendary you particularly like, but then you get a better one, you can swap its look onto the new one um, and keep your kind of overall look. So it's, it's, it's a nice system. It kind of, yeah. I don't know, it's for the fashion conscious of us. But, uh, it's, it's so... Um, completely unnecessary, but the fact they've thought of that just makes me love them. Yeah, it's really nice because the uh, the Crusader has some really cool armor. Like the, I think it's actually, in fact my favorite armor for them is probably the the kind of armor that's on the character selection screen. It's kind of just like black battle plate. It looks very industrial, very kind of practical, and I really liked it. And I just kind of wore that most of the time. It looked really good. Yeah. Um, and they've also got a, a shield that goes with it. It's kind of like a, a white shield with a black rim on it and a black Crusader symbol. And I think, again, that looks badass. So I just kind of walked around with the default Crusader armor on, and I thought I was awesome. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, the transmogrification is great. And it's not that expensive, although I think if you start slapping the legendary skins on things, I think they go in, like, the 20,000, 30,000 range. Um, right. But normal things are normally, like, 500 gold. So you can change your look as much as you like. So, yeah, she's, uh, she's a great addition. I believe she was going to be in the base game, but they never got it down, so they took her out. And then they put it back in for the uh, expansion. Um, so yeah, it's interesting they add her to the expansion and not the um, two point update. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Blizzard kind of have have a history well, to, of doing this. To be honest, I'm guessing everyone's buying the uh, everyone who has the games bought the uh, expansion, haven't they? Well, I think everyone who's kind of playing it any any degree. Um, I think last time I checked, Reaper of Souls had sold something like two point seven million. Um, but Diablo had sold something like 12 million. So that'll probably increase as time goes on, because I think the, the new patch is getting, getting a lot of word of mouth at the moment. Yeah. Um, Including positive. great feedback from Screenhog UK. Yeah, it's great, man. Um, so, yeah, so I... Uh, it's on your purchase order, so... 
as a, as an essential, as a you know, how much how much money would you be willing to drop? Well, I I got this for twenty five quid, which is reasonably cheap actually, because I think it's going for something like thirty three thirty five if you just kind of buy it mm-hmm. at full price, which is is expensive for an expansion pack, I think. However, yeah. when I've sat and I've got nearly two full days worth of entertainment inside of two weeks, and I've been to go and work. In fact, I was away for business for most of the second week, so I couldn't play it even if I wanted to. I don't know, man. I, I feel like I've got more than my money's worth, and I, I've, got, I've got no intention of stopping anyway. I've still got to level up my original Barbarian. I've even started to level up um, one of every class just to have a play around with them. Adventure yeah. mode is always fun. The new loot's great. I, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. I, the new the new kind of flexibility on the spec and how, how versatile everything is now is great. This is so much value for money. It's crazy. And I already like Diablo a lot, so this is just fucking just icing it on the cake, really. Um, it's great. And this so, will be part of the um, PS4 version, correct? It will be, yes. Yes. The PS4 Good. version is going to be called the Ultimate Evil Edition, and it's basically going to be uh, based on Reaper of Souls uh, quality, well, level of Diablo. So I'm really looking forward to playing it again on, on PS4 because, yeah. Christ, it, it's, it's going to be so much fun sitting doing couch co-op again. Yeah, I know. And But yeah. what characters are we going to pick? Cause you, what, what are you going to go with if there's two of us? I don't know, man. It doesn't really matter because it's not like yeah, like an MMO where you all have different like roles to fill. You can just literally both be the same thing and smash, shink, smash things no, in the face. No, we can't both be the same thing. There's no fun in that. <laughs> well, I'm not really bothered. I'll, I, I've played shitloads of barbarians. I'll play him. I love the Crusader. I'll play them. I've dabbled with the Monk. Um, I've even played quite a bit of Witch Doctor. <laughs> Although they're, <laughs> they're quite an odd class. Um, they have got a really good new ability in, in Reaper of Souls. It's called Piranhas, where they summon a pool of piranhas that eat people. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty sure they've got a rune. I can't remember what the rune's called, but it basically swaps out the piranhas for a giant alligator that swallows things whole. Nice. So it's. Uh, I find yeah. that one might be a lot harder to use than just hitting someone with a shield. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how the flow right. <laughs> no, it's it's a, it's a strange uh, it's a strange class. The the, the witch doctor. Um, I think it said on when me and Matthew were playing it on the uh, the Xbox and we did a video. I played as the witch doctor on that, and that was the one class that didn't translate all that well to control pads. It's it feels better on the keyboard. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it looks it still looks a lot of fun on especially on the PC version where you've got a mouse to target things. But one thing that confuses me is they this basically their specialty is they summon a shit ton of minions. It always looks like there's a like a swarm of enemies on the screen when they're about just because they have that many these days. It's it's fucking crazy. But uh, yeah, Reaper Souls for me, I would have happily paid full price. I didn't even have to, but. I didn't in the end, but I would have happily paid it and got my value yeah. money. I think this is a great addition. This is what Diablo probably should have been. Diablo 3 should, probably should have been from the beginning to kind of quash all the uh, the complaints. But from what I've read, Diablo 2, which is kind of almost legendary in its status these days, was kind of the same. The, the base game came out and a lot of people criticized it. Then Lord of Destruction, the, its expansion pack, came out. And then it kind of reached this legendary status over yeah. time. So it sounds like Blizzard have almost gone back through their motions. Um, but yeah, I really can't complain. It does a lot right. Uh, and it got rid of a lot of the crap that was wrong with Diablo. And it's, it's, it's sapping my life away. Not even slowly, <laughs> just very, very quickly, in fact. <laughs> well, that's what you bought it for, right? <laughs> yeah. You I knew know. what was going to happen. I did know what was going to happen. I, uh, I I was off the week it came out, and I had so much planned, and that never happened. None of it happened. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys need any help? It's one of those freaks! Whoa! No, 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 no! <laughs> oh, this fast healing stuff is going to come in real handy. Okay then, what else have we got? Uh, right, well, something we can both talk about. Uh, we have got infamous Second Sons. Second, is it yeah. Second Son? Second Son? Second Son. Second, second Son, yeah. Yeah, singular, not plural. Um, best thing you can say about this game? It looks fucking sweet. 
It looks gorgeous, man. Uh, so it is the third in the Infamous series from Studio Sucker Punch, a PS4 exclusive, whereas Infamous and Infamous 2 were PS3 exclusives. Now, yeah. Infamous was one of the games Sony gave away after the whole PlayStation Network hacking debacle was, yeah. a few years ago. And it I was think a very well-received now... game, and it was given away for free rather quickly, if like um, compared to what are like the a... PS... Plus games are. Yeah, I think it was like inside a year, maybe a bit more, but it was before PS Plus was a big thing anyway, and certainly before it, they were giving games away on PS Plus, but I think It was that's... certainly a big deal that that was the game that was given away free. It was almost like we fucked up this bad. Yeah, and hey, Infamous and Infamous 2 were great games. They yeah. felt a little overlooked, maybe because they were PS3 exclusives before it really hit its stride later in, in, mm-hmm. in the cycle. Um, but I think the fact that they gave Infamous out as a free game is actually coming back to reward them now because I've spoken to a few people who were like, oh, yeah, I never knew what Infamous was, but I got it part of that free deal, and I really <laughs> want Second Sons now. I've had a few people really like kind of thinking about buying a PS4 yeah. just for Second Son. And... I've not heard that, but that just makes total sense to me because... I mean, I only knew one friend who actually bought it when it came out, and that's where I played it extensively, and I loved it. And um, I can easily see how people would have missed it and given away a free, you know, come round. Yeah, we'll wait until we have a $50 game to release on the third part of the trilogy, and then you'll buy that one. Yeah. (laughs) So, Infamous Second Son is... Well, while it is the third game in the series, it's pretty much a new a new start. You don't have to yeah. play the previous games at all, but uh, it's basically a third-person action game, uh, kind of set in a free room recreation of Seattle. And you take the role of a young man called Deslin Rowe, who is a Native American or Native American descent, and he lives on a plant like, well, would you call it a plantation? Or no, uh, an Indian reserve in yeah, uh, the yeah. Northwest America. He's kind of a bit of a, a delinquent, a bit of a dropout. He, he just kind of hangs around, causing trouble. He, you know, he, he does a lot of graffiti. Um, he's not a bad guy, but he, you know, he's a bit of a, a mischief maker. And his older brother Reggie is uh, the local cop or the local sheriff, so he's always causing problems for his brother. And uh, it's not far, like their their reservation is not far from a, um, a prison for conduits. Now, conduits are essentially X Men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're the people who have a natural tendency to have superpowers, and they're basically since the since the events of the second game, they are essentially illegal. And there's a force called the DUP who round them up and imprison them. So one day, when uh, some prisoners are getting transported from this prison to somewhere else, there there's an accident and they crash just outside of Deslin's uh, reserve. And he goes and tries to help one of them, and he touches him, and he finds out he's actually a conduit, but his power is to absorb other conduits' powers. And he absorbs that conduit's powers, and he gains smoke powers. And um, kind of a, a lot of shit goes on. The three conduits in the in the van escape, including the one he's absorbed powers of. No, actually, that's completely wrong, isn't it? Um, no, he, I thought three escaped. Two of them escape, but the one you get smoke powers from gets captured. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I see what you mean. He gets recaptured. Yeah, so he gets recaptured by the head of yeah. the DUP, um, a woman called Augustine, who is, in fact, herself a conduit who has the pa- who has power. Such an obscure power. When they were, I would love to know what yeah. they were, like, smoking or what they were the fucking the meeting that decided her power. Yeah, but her power pretty, pa- makes sense. Yeah, her power is concrete, and basically what happens is she captures, recaptures the guy you got, like, the, the, the guy you got small powers off, and then she questions you because she thinks something's up. And she basically fucking, like, tortures the members of your tribe and inserts loads of concrete daggers into them that are slowly killing them. And there's no way to get them out <laughs> unless you have concrete powers to extract them. And so basically you, Deslin and Richie, uh, sorry, Richie, Reggie, go on a mission to track down Augustine to get Deslin to absorb her powers and, like, save the, the fucking tribe. It's such a bizarre <laughs> storyline. It is actually, yeah. <laughs> But like basically, the, the majority of the game set in Seattle, and it's it's you developing your powers, uh, recruiting other conduits to help you take down Augustine and dismantle the DUP, and you can you can play it as either good, a hero, or e, uh, e evil. Sorry, uh, infamous. And that's that's pretty much the setup. Yeah, and um, the way that I've been through playing it, it's, it kind of reminds me of a cross between Far Cry Three and Assassin's Creed style games. Where yeah. 
you know, it's a third-person action game. It's, a, it's always going to remind you of Assassin's Creed these days. But in, in terms of Far Cry, there's sort of like... The, the Seattle's split into two halves, and you don't get the first half until you progress through the story enough. But then it's broken up into regions, and each region has, like, towers that you have to dismantle and uh, walls yeah, to tag. You end up destabilized like... to the point of eradicating the DP. It just reminded me a lot of uh, Far Cry 3. Yeah, it's got that kind of... It gives you a lot of like kind of mini tasks to do within a wider area, and as you do, you reckon kind of reclaim that area. Um, so as you say, like there's there's kind of um, there's one side mission that has you hunting down undercover DUP agents, and then there's another that has you tagging the wall, the streets with your graffiti. Yeah. Um, I quite like them because when you do them, you've got to you've got to like shake up your control oh, pad and hold it to the side like a spray can, and then you got to like move it as if you're spraying. And yeah, you know, I've been, I've never been a, an advocate of motion controls, but these are kind of fun. They not only do they work really well, it's it's not cumbersome, it's it's fun. And you know, you can actually get away with you can just rotate it once and rotate it back and then play through the mini game with it as a normal controller. But uh, you don't want to do that. No man, you gotta you've gotta hold it like a well spray gun. I like <laughs> Yeah, I did, I thought it was really it's, fun. Uh, you uh, you know how your controller can spit out volume. As you're shaking it, your controller makes the clicky noise that a spray can would make, like, as you're shaking it in your ear. Yeah, it does. So... There's a lot of good uses of that, because uh, it, it does seem to try and use the DualShock 4 as much as it can. It does a lot of things on the uh, the touchpad, like yeah. you can, y- y- your powers that you have, your smoke power that you start off with, you need to absorb smoke in order to keep going. You've got It's a finite resource in your body, and you've got to basically find a source of smoke, which could be a chimney stack, it could be an exploded car. And you've got to go up and press the touchpad and you suck it through you and it recharge your batteries, as it were. Um, and there's also a few context-sensitive kind of actions that are tied to the, the touchpad. Um, it's not, you know, it's nothing you couldn't have put on a, a normal button, but it's just nice. It's kind of using it as an extra button with a, a kind of a bit of touch functionality built in. So it was kind of nice like that. But uh, Yeah, I was quite happy with it. Um, it was just nice to see some of these extra features pulled in. This is... Obviously, the closest thing we've... Well, this is the first example of a truly next-gen game. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's it's primary kind of reason for being a next-gen game is its graphics, because it looks gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Uh, the character models are incredibly detailed and realistic. They, they've they been bolstered by capturing um, performance as well. Yeah, it looks real, like the... Uh... Not just, like, the detail of the face, but the sort of the movements of the face. They must have had some decent mocap, because you can imagine it. It almost it's it's like Avatar good at times. It's very very good. It's it's incredibly incredibly detailed. Um, as you, you're right though, the, there's just a kind of natural, it's yeah. just a natural feel of them that you don't often get. Everyone feels like um, like the cutscenes don't feel like cutscenes of a video game. It almost feels like you're watching a pre-rendered like movie or TV show. And the storyline's all right. It's fairly engaging, but the performances. Are good enough to make you like truly engage with what's going on. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the Deslin's actually voiced by Troy Baker, who is pretty is. much in every video <laughs> game going at the moment. I mean, fucking. I don't know Joel. why I bothered looking it up, to be honest. I know, man. It's he's he's in everything, man. Uh, but he's really good. And Deslin, yeah. What what I was actually impressed about is Troy, Troy Baker. You know, he's, we see he's in everything, and he is. I mean, he's fucking Booker in Bioshock. He's Joel in The Last of Us. Uh, you know, he, he was the Joker in ba- uh, Batman Arkham Origins. Yeah. Um, but again, with Deslin, he sounds completely different. He, you know, he's, he is a different character. It's not just Troy Baker turning up to do a voice. He, he's really good at creating different voices and different characters. And Yeah. And it's I a really know. good character as well, because you can see how this, this man, he gets powers that it could take him down either path. Yeah. And the, what's, oh God, what's his name again? We've just talked about him, Troy Baker. Yeah. Um, he pulls off. I'm guessing both aspects really well because it feels like a real enough person that, yeah, maybe this would corrupt you or maybe this would be your salvation. Now, I'm just wondering, are you playing good or evil? I'm playing good. I always play good. Yeah, I, I play through the game uh, good. Um, now, the, the I, I gotta, I got to admit, yeah, the good the good does flow fairly well. It, it does seem good, but the, the evil is a little bit more awkward. Um Right. I never get the impression that Deslin is outright evil. I think at worst he could probably just be a bit of a dick. Yeah. Whereas in good, I think he's, not, he's he's kind of he's a bit of a, a bit of a mischief maker, but he's generally good at heart. Whereas the evil was a bit a bit more awkward. And also because Reggie, your your older brother, is a cop and he's helping you, 
there was always something in the back of my mind going, you know, you're killing loads and loads of people. I don't think <laughs> Reggie would still be helping you at this point. It's like, so the, the evil right. doesn't fit into the game quite as much, but it's, I th- think that's one of the game's biggest shortcomings is the good and evil is, v- is very, very kind of stilted and black and white. Um, you know, it's, you are good or you are evil. Yeah. And if you decide, to, so if you're playing the game good and suddenly something happens in the story that would turn you na- naturally evil, not that I'm saying that actually happens or anything, but, uh, you're kind of stuck because if you yeah, start doing too bad much things waste. now, yeah, it's like um, uh, I, I guess with some of the United Old Republic games again, you, you end up too far down one side for any of your actions to mean anything. Yeah, you've you've kind of got to go good, otherwise you're wasting a transaction of like you know getting more good points. Yeah, almost. Um, it's almost like there should be two separate bars because there's some powers that you need to be evil for and uh, some powers you need to be good for. And I'm not saying that you would get like either of them. You would get end up getting both of them because I, I imagine that's impossible, even if you had this two bar system. But it would be nice to have a bit more duality to your character. Yeah, it it is a bit clunky, and especially in ga- when we have games like The Witcher or The Witcher Two, more precisely, which it does morality, but in such a grey way. Yeah, like, nothing's particularly good or bad. It's just what you do, and it has consequences. I think that's more interesting than you know having a well, red and blue three. Option. Um, you can be as good as you do one evil thing, they'll still talk about that one thing behind, yeah. like, whenever you get through somewhere. I know. So, yeah, I think we're moving beyond that kind of black and white morality system. Uh, so I think that's this, that's this game's biggest shortcoming. I mean, um, compared it to the first two, I never played the second one, to be perfectly honest, but the first oh, one the was... The second one was good. It was just as black and white, as far as I can remember. It was. But I always it, it feel like this, this mischiefy sides to being good and he's, he's he's having fun as well let's not forget that oh he loves his <laughs> he's, powers he's gone from an ordinary delinquent to a superpower delinquent within a day he loves it um it's a different kind of good to in the first game it almost feels a bit more gray area but it's still too black and white yeah it, it is it's and like the uh, it, it just signposts everything very obviously like every time oh, you yeah. get a major choice you've literally got to hold down your respective shoulder button like good or evil and then let the camera sweep over to that direction and then hit start to make sure you want to select it yeah it's it's very signposted. it's not like your little um shoulder buttons in mass effect where it's just like oh you got three seconds to decide if you want to do something evil yeah yeah it's not even like i mean mass effect does it you know in a very kind of black and white way as well um but no, like Mass Effect handled it better because, yeah. as much as I played as a paragon, a good guy in Mass Effect, I still did some renegade stuff. Oh yeah, every now and uh, again you just had to, especially at the start of Mass Effect Two. I found. Yeah, I, was I, 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 I always, uh, I always pushed that guy out the window. In Mass Effect, which guy? There's a mercenary mouth and up to yeah, and like you can, you can just shove him out the window. Oh, I don't think I've ever come across that. Oh, it's so good. I always do that. It's just too I was um, twat the guy with the uh, electric screwdriver who's fixing the helicopter. <laughs> yeah, it's too fun not to. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, anyway, yeah. Um, this, this does, so regarding this... the game looks again, I just want to say that the game looks great and the character models are great, but you don't have a clue as to how great it looks until you unlock Neon. Oh, God, Neon power. So, yeah, I mean, just to touch, I mean, we said uh, Desmond gets smoke. His, his abilities actually absorb other powers. There are four powers in the game, but I would, Sony have been keeping the second two powers a secret, so I won't spoil them here either. Um, but Smoke and Neon were the ones that were announced before the game came out. And Neon, oh my god, it's beautiful, man. It's so nice. You kind of get a tease on it early on, because um, you're following the conduit into Seattle. And you, there's this, like, pink swirls, like, on the, in this tunnel. And I was wondering, like, what is this power? This is what I want. Yeah, it's, it's really I hadn't good. watched the trails or anything, but, um, damn, when you unlock it, and I find that smoke's a bit more powerful in combat situations, but I just have Neon equipped just for the fun and the, the look of it. Yeah, Neon's great fun. I love the, like, every every power has a kind of movement ability, like smoke is you turn into a cloud of smoke and dash forward, whereas Neon is kind of you turn into a neon outline of a man and you just sprint and you can run up the side of buildings and... It's so much fun. It's great. And I love the, uh, like, you, you can fire, like, lasers of neon out, superheated yeah. neon gas. Um, and if you're playing evil, if you zap people in the head, you obliterate them. So you hit them in the head, and they just turn into shards of glass and shatter. 
It, uh, it looks fucking awesome. Um, the the good version is not nearly as fun. You've got to shoot them in the legs, and they kind of get wrapped in a neon blanket and like kind of pinned to the ground. Yeah, I've unlocked that. <laughs> it's uh, it's not nearly as fun. Because <laughs> what I did, did was um, I completely cleared the top half of the game with all these side missions before I un- even unlocked the neon power. Oh, really? Uh, so that by the time I unlocked it, I had so many of those shard things. Um, I just I could just upgrade every single power fully. <laughs> so I had it all at once. It was great. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Neon, Neon's good. And I've got to say, the mission where you're trying to track down the conduit who has that power, it's oh, fucking so beautiful, fun. man. Where, she's, where, where they're leaving um, cr- like crime scenes full of neon drawings and stuff. It's, yeah, it's great. It's... I mean, a bit more puzzle might have been nice, but just in terms of the looks, it was stunning. And I can't fault the game for the aesthetics. It's perfect. Yeah, they're, they're, they're gorgeous. And if this trend continues, I mean, I can imagine Watch Dogs has hopefully, you know, it's had some ropey first, second impressions on the demo that was released, but if they can pull off something that looks as good as this and deliver a, an interesting game to boot, it'll be pretty good. I hope so. It's, uh, it's a long time in the making now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like aside from graphics uh, st- and story, I suppose the the, the core gameplay. Uh, if you played the original Infamous, it's it's very much intact, other than now you have a number of powers to choose from. Um, so you can basically fire out a projectile, you can fire out a strong projectile. Uh, you've got big missiles you can launch in a limited quantity. Uh, you can zip around in various methods dep- depending on which power you've currently got selected. Um, you know, there's a lot of lot of variety, and each. Yeah. While each power has a kind of universal feel, they've all got their own little niches. Yeah, like, it's, s- smoke has the more powerful missile, I find, and that's better for clearing out sort of the, the bigger enemies. But the one is a bit more quick and nippy, and it's you've got a balance between what sort of fight you're going to be in, because you can't have both equipped at once. If you want no, Neon, I'm you have to, like, zip, you have to zip the, um, and find it. Yeah, I gotta say that that took me by surprise. I was under yeah, the impression did. going in that I would be able to switch between powers on the fly, but that's not the case, as you say. No. If basically what powers you're choose. using, yeah, basically you've got to choose which one you're equipped with at any given time, and it's not something you go to a menu and choose. You've actually got to find a power source and and drain it, and then you switch to that power. So if you want neon, you've got to find a neon sign and drain it. If you want smoke, you've got to find a smoke stack and drain it. Uh, you know, same for the other two powers. Although I will say the last power. Uh, the, which is only unlocked uh, kind of after you finish the main storyline. All right. You have to uh, that, as far as I'm aware, you don't actually drain that from anywhere. It just it recovers over time. So right. that's that's different again. So basically, it's a, it's like a kind of a cooldown based power rather than a resource based. So how do you flick to it? Uh, no, I haven't got that far. I've only just unlocked the second island. That's a fucking good point. I don't know, actually. I haven't played that much since I finished the game. Uh, yeah. I only finished it the other the other night. Um, I haven't played on it a, a whole lot. But uh, anyway... Um, In terms yeah, so... of the combat itself, I've got to say, um, I've never played a game that so... It recreates, like, the X-Men cartoons combat style so well. I've never seen... I've never played superhero combat as good as it is in this game. It is a lot of fun. At first, I thought, I was kind of trying to play it as a shooter. I was trying to take cover and just fire like, yeah. guns while I was standing still. But I was thinking, I was getting killed a lot, and I was thinking, you know what, this is this is not working for me. And then I, I tried to mix it up and use all my powers, all my abilities, dashing between oh, them, yeah. striking them with melee, turning around, blowing a couple of guys over the heavy shot, dashing to the one that was on the floor, trying to subdue him before he gets back up. And I think if you do try to play it like a superhero rather than a shooter, you get far better results. Yeah. And you are That's right. exactly I did the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's because the first thing it gives you is just a shot. So you're like, all right, then I'll play it as a shooter. And you, you kind of you kind of just ingrained to do that. But once you do get into it and start mixing and matching the powers and being a bit more dynamic in your movement and your your attack patterns, it starts to really shine, and it's it's great fun. It's it becomes almost, I imagine, as close to a superhero simulator as you would get because you've got to really like Superman has got so much stuff in his arsenal. That's a completely different thing because Superman's fucking immortal, but. He must, when he's fighting a big group of enemies, he must be thinking like, right, I, I can do all this shit, what am I going to do next? And you've got to really know what your powers are to be able to use them, and you've got to mix between them on the fly so quickly. Because they throw a lot of enemies at you at times. Oh, yeah, and 
I think, that, again, the one thing that's slightly irritating about this game, I, 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 maybe a bit of a downfall, is that there's not a great deal of the, the, like variety for the enemies, I found. No. Um, from beginning like to I, end... Uh, Assassin's Creed again, there's only about... Well, I've, I've come across four. maybe six or seven types of enemies. Oh, really? I would only say there's probably about four or five, really. Yeah, fair I, enough, I don't know, it depends, yeah. it depends how far you really go. But in essence, you're always going to be fi- fighting uh, DUP soldiers who have concrete powers and an assault rifle. Yeah. Uh, you know, you occasionally fight helicopters, um, and occasionally fight, fight guys with snipe rifles who to take a lot of health off you with one shot. Uh, you know, there's heavy, heavy DUPs who rely solely on kind of concrete armor they've got on them. And then there's like super heavies who are concrete armor chain gun guys, but you're generally fighting the same flavor of enemy over and over again. And the super fa- the, their superpowers are kind of like a, a limited version of the concrete power of the main villain. But it does mean that they're they're a bit more dynamic than your average foot soldier, so it does help combat kind of keep a bit of di- like you know it keeps it a bit more interesting than it otherwise could have been. But I remember in the second game at least, well, not even in the first game, there was a more variation in the enemies. Like in yeah. the first game, I remember those three islands, and every island had a different enemy faction, and I think there was two enemy factions or three enemy factions in the uh, the, the second game as well. Uh, one of whom, which were giant mutant monster things, which was quite cool. Um, so yeah, the, the, yeah, there's not that I agree with you. variety, but uh, it's still. Then there's a the lot of the game lacks variety because in each region you're doing the same side missions over and over again. You are, yeah. you are. This this feels like a game. I mean, it looks gorgeous, and it, it's when it's in full swing, it's very, very fun. But it does have, feel like it does have a, some shortcomings. You're right; it, it does lack variety. Uh, you know, you, you are playing the same tasks in every district uh, over and over again. Um, the the storyline and the story missions are short. I uh, had I pretty much got eighty percent of this game done in a single day, and I actually held off finishing it. Uh, and the only reason I didn't finish it, like inside a weekend is because Reaper of Souls came out mm-hmm. and distracted me. Um, and then when I kind of went back to finish it the other day, I'd finished it with inside of two hours or something, and I was kind of like, well, I enjoyed the hell out of it when it was like going, but it didn't last long enough. And even even the story, while the story itself's pretty good in in certain places, it's got you know the, the cutscenes are, are good, uh, they look great, and they're well voiced and well acted. Uh, the the kind of general flow of the story is a bit uh, a bit stilted as well. It always seems to be like you go to an area of the city where a conduit's hiding out. You track down that conduit to absorb his powers as a means of getting closer to Augustine. Yeah. And that's pretty much, you know, rinse and repeat. Um, so, yeah, but at the same time, I feel like this game is is fun. It's gorgeous. And quite frankly, if you own a PS4 at this point, you should probably own this game. There's no reason not yeah. to. I think this is the this game. Is what, was... like, this, is, this is what the launch title we deserved was, really. Yeah, this should have been a launch title. Um, either this should have been a launch title, or we should have left it another year to maybe give it a bit more time in development. Maybe, maybe give yeah. it a bit more variety. Uh, it, like it, basically, if you want a PS4 now, this is probably the best exclusive going, and it certainly gives us an early glimpse of what this console is going to be capable of. So, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, what I would say is, if you're looking for a reason to buy a PS4, this probably isn't it. But if you're looking for an excuse then yeah, this is the perfect excuse to go and buy one. And if you've already got one, you should definitely get it. Yeah, basically, there's no reason not to. Um, and I would have been happy to pay full price for this. In fact, I went in intending to, but as I say, I traded in um, various means, and you know, we talked about being a stockbroker, and I managed to pick it up for £8. <laughs> did you really? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, I did pay full price, and I don't feel I don't feel bitter about that. However, I feel like if this... If this had come out maybe further on in the generation where it's got more stiff competition, I possibly would have bought it at a reduced price. Yeah, probably. But it's not it's a bad game by any... PS4 at the minute, so... Yeah, well, you know, it's early in the console cycle. Like, it's always the same, but... Um, I imagine I'd... as well that this isn't going to be one that stays on my shelf. No, I this think when I'm done with it... In dogs, I imagine. I think when I'm done with this, I'm going to be done with it. There's no multiplayer. Yeah. Um, I think because it's short, I think I'm going to I'm going to try and platinum it because oh, I don't yeah. think it's going to, it's going to be hard. Um, the only thing that's going to be hard about it is that you have to complete the game on like the top difficulty. So I'm going to do an evil playthrough on the top difficulty, and then I'll probably be done with it. Uh, 
But yeah, it's if you've got a PS4, you should probably be at least give this a try. Um, but you're right, it's not the the masterpiece that I was hoping it was going to be. I don't think I actually enjoyed it as much as I did the second game. I think I prefer the second um, Infamous Two. I mean, I think I only played highlights from the first game, but I probably enjoyed that one more as well. It did look half as good. But... <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, I mean, one thing actually in terms of the graphics, how good how good the graphics are is the lighting is fucking gorgeous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's um, but yeah, Infamous is a is a really solid action game. It's a great exclusive. It's just that it falls slightly short of short of greatness. It's it's a really good game, but it's not particularly great. Um, but yeah, I'd still I'd still say you could probably get you probably get fifty pounds worth of enjoyment out of this if that's what you're going to pay for. Oh, it. Yeah. and then and then, might and then get whatever you feel like you haven't got out of it by trading it in again. Um, that's yeah. my two cents. Watchdogs in June. That's where mine's going. Is that what it is? I'm not really excited for Watch Dogs, but I'll, I probably will get it because I, I usually do that in games. Like I don't really care about them until they're out, and they're like, "Oh shit, I need it." I've never seen someone do that to such a degree as to you with Borderlands Two. Yeah, <laughs> I did it. With, I was giving um, up for about six months because I fucking loved the first one so much. I never played the last one. Yeah, no. yeah I, I do it all the time. I did it with Titanfall. Um, yeah, which incidentally is the last game we've got to do tonight. Wow. Fucking segue! It was only a matter of time. All of our fight, all of our sacrifice has bought us this one day. He's XIMC. I don't trust him and neither should you. War changes a man. It's a hard life keeping the peace on the frontier. Everyone has their limits. Right, yeah, so Titanfall. So we've gone through the, the PS4's big name exclusive. So let's go through the Xbox One's big name exclusive. So right off the bat, I'll tell you, I played it on PC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so such I, an exclusive, isn't it? I, uh, so I got to play the, the slightly prettier, um, slightly better running version of, of the game. Um, so Titanfall is a 6v6 multiplayer first-person shooter from Respawn Entertainment, a studio formed by the guys who created Call of Duty, who left after Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 due to some kind of uh, dispute with Activision. They went off and formed their own studio and then partnered up with EA, of all people, because, you know, if you, <laughs> if you leave to, if you leave Activision so you can establish more creative freedom and then partner up with EA, <laughs> you get what's fucking coming to you, really. Um... <laughs> so this is an Xbox One exclusive. Now, I, I mean, before I go into the review, I always got the impression that this wasn't originally an Xbox exclusive, but EA no. made some deals behind Respawn's back. Well, this was, I'm sure this was mentioned at some point in a Sony conference in the build-up to launch. Or at I, least I, I, in the Respawn thing, they mentioned Sony in it. Well, the impression I got is basically the guy at Respawn, when he got found out, he found out it was going to be like an Xbox exclusive when the public did. And he was kind of like, all uh -huh. right, I didn't know that. And I think their intention was to launch on multi multi platform. Um, and the impression I get basically is what happened is before the consoles launched, maybe even before, uh, maybe even before the Xbox One, PS4 were announced, and all the all the shit, backlash and shit happened. Yeah. Um, EA made a deal with Microsoft. You know, my, Xbox has the biggest audience in the Western Hemisphere. It's, it's always selling the most multi-platform games. So let's go ahead and just make an exclusive. So Microsoft paid for an exclusivity deal, and EA said, great, that's fucking amazing. We'll launch on Xbox One. Yeah. And then the consoles were announced. All the backlash happened. Sony now selling more consoles. Multi-platform games are selling two to one against Xbox. I think EA are now regretting it. So much so that I think I it's think pretty, probably, yeah. pretty much all but confirmed that if there's a Titanfall 2, which there most certainly will be, it'll be multi-platform. I'm fairly certain that that was confirmed before Titanfall 1 launched. Probably. I think it's been... I think that was the, the kind of initial... Well, I think that was the general feeling of what was going to happen, especially considering this didn't start off as an exclusive. And shit, if, it's not... If, this, if even Titanfall came to the PS4 eventually, it wouldn't be the first time Microsoft had let an exclusive slip. I mean, Mass Effect. Mass Effect, yeah. Uh, is a prime example, but I digress. So yeah, Titanfall. I've been playing on PC. Uh, as I say, it's a 6v6 um, multiplayer online shooter. Um, 
No, at first glance, it feels very much like Call of Duty in space. It's very fast-paced. Uh, kills are very quick to get. You're very quick to be killed. Uh, you use iron sights. It's all very kind of militaristic and then, you know, very kind of... I always feel like in Call of Duty, your weapons felt like proper hardware in your hands. The weapons feel like that. And this game yeah, yeah. feel kind of like sci-fi lasers or anything like that. They all feel like proper industrial-style weapons. But um, it's actually... It, I mean, what Respawn Entertainment's mission was for this game is to kind of shake up the stagnant first-person shooter genre. Now, since Call of Duty Modern Warfare came along, everything is trying to copy that success. Every yeah. fucking shooter series now has perks, it now has loadouts, it has fucking unlockables behind the XP barrier. I mean, Christ, even Halo is starting to adopt that type of approach to multiplayer. Yeah. And it's it's basically creating kind of like a fucking basically a big grey blob of uh, first-person uh, shooter genre. We no longer have any diversity. Everything's kind of the same. But this Again, goes... not to like get into speculation, but do you think that's possibly one of the things they had the disagreement with Activision about? I think that I think they basically didn't want to keep pumping out uh, Call of Duty games every two years. I think they wanted to go in a different direction and, and yeah. Activision wouldn't let them. Um, and I think there was also some disputes over bonuses. Activision right. held bonuses, and they were just like, fuck this. That, that, that was like finally on the coffin. I don't know, really. I've not really read up on it. But uh, yeah, so Titanfall basically is the, the guys who give us the, what is the staple of modern mili- well, modern first person shooters, and they're trying to shake it up a little bit. So Titanfall does feel like Call of Duty in space. It has levels, it has unlockables, it has loadouts, perks, uh, challenges, and all, all the kind of standard stuff. But it does a few things to kind of sh- shake things up. The first thing is. Uh, you play as, I mean, the characters you play as are known as pilots, and they're kind of like the special forces of, of the army you're fighting for in the sci-fi world. And you guys are equipped with a jump pack, which allows you to basically free run, a la Assassin's Creed, or more like, a, uh, more like Prince of Persia, to be honest. You can run along walls, you can double jump, you can vault huge distances, you can run across rooftops. There's a huge amount of mobility that I haven't really seen in a first-person shooter since the days of Unreal Tournament and Quake 3 Arena. Yeah. Uh, and it's fantastic because straight away it introduces a verticality into the game that takes a while to get used to. When I first started really playing the game... Yeah, I mean, you, you played it a bit of mine. It, it, when you first start playing... I didn't get used of, to it in the sort of half hour I was playing. No, no, but it, 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 it does to, take a while. You have to really... It's almost like you have to think about it until it becomes second nature because you're just so not used to having these options available to you. Like, there was one time when I ran around something, like, what the fuck did you do that for? <laughs> I know. And it's just like, I know. When you just it. to run around this thing. Well, that's it. When I first started playing, I was only looking for enemies kind of in front of me or on the same level as me. I was, I was only kind of walking through corridors and around things like yourself. I was guarding doors to rooms as if they were the only way to get in. And then I was getting shot <laughs> by, like, people jumping through windows and coming through skylights and stuff. And I just had no way to fucking spot them because they just bushwhacked us before I had a chance to even look. And after a while, you start getting used to it. And eventually, the floor, you know, you're kind of like playing the floor as lava. <laughs> you're never on the floor yeah. because you're going to get <laughs> fucking crushed. So there's this fantastic degree of movement. So it almost combines this the the energetic, erratic pace of an arena shooter from the 90s with the, the more steady, militarized shooting of, of the noughties. And creates kind of a bit of a hybrid of the two, and it's really fun. It's really, really good. It, it's very something very different. It creates a, a complete different flow and feel to the the, the kind of infantry based gameplay. And uh, like I say, I fucking love it, man. It's it's great fun. Um, Is it the, the revolution again that we were promised? I don't know if you can say it's a revolution because I don't feel like free running would be appropriate for all first person shooters. But yeah. if we were going to see a return of like Unreal Tournament, I wouldn't be upset. But because, uh, this was... Just... Well, I think, first of all, we were overdoing Unreal Game. So what was the last one, like 2008, 2009? Uh, yeah, it was Unreal 3. It was at the beginning of the last generation. Yeah. Um, but this was a very much on the hype train leading into um, a launch of the new consoles. And as you say, it's probably, this, you know, the exclusive changed hands a few times based on public perception, and obviously this is the game that a lot of people are waiting for. Is, do you think it's been worth the wait? Uh, uh, yeah, I do, actually. I think if uh, I think actually this is possibly the, the best game on offer on either next-gen console, quite frankly. Um, 
it's it's just shit ton of fun. It captures that great essence that Call of Duty caught back in the modern war, early modern warfare days, um, and then and slaps something a, a very different. Uh, I mean, on top of the free running, you've actually got the Titans themselves, which completely change up gameplay. So the general deal with the Titans are they are twenty foot mechanoid tanks that you call in via airdrop every two minutes, um, and then you can reduce that two minute kind of drop time by killing other people. I think every kill you make is 12 seconds off the timer. Basically, you can call in your, your Titan, you can hop in it, and just stomp around the levels in these huge robots murdering people. And it's so much fun when you get into a Titan because infantry, if, if you catch uh, another pilot, another player out in the open, you'll just obliterate them with your weaponry. They can't withstand a head-on assault no, against no. the Titan. Um, it's not like up... fighting, um, again, I'm conditioned. I, in Halo 4, can take down a, I couldn't even know, a locust, what are they called? Uh, Mantis. Yeah, I can take down a Mantis one-on-one, like me on foot, him in his machine. So I was like, yeah, what a fucking Titan, I can get this bad boy out. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like, different. Titans are fast, they are lethal, um, I mean, they're, they're, they all carry a huge weapon, uh, which can range from like a, a chain gun, a 40 millimeter cannon, a plasma cannon... Um, a gun that shoots giant arcs of electricity, um, a giant grenade launcher that fires grenades the size of your fucking head out uh, and just explode. And if you get caught as a pilot by a, by a Titan, they'll just shoot you dead straight away. You'll be fucking stain on the wall. If you get too close, they can do a melee punch that just obliterates into red mist. Um, they will fuck infantry up who they catch out in the open. However... Because the pilot characters that you're, you as a foot soldier are so agile, you can kind of get up and around and on top of the Titans, and you can do something called rode- yeah. rodeoing them. Rodeoing them, yeah. And basically, you jump on the back of them, and you can rip off armor plating and expose their like circuitry underneath and shoot through their shield into that circuitry. And the Titans are equipped with a shield, much like a Halo-style shield, that recharges, but they've also got a health bar that doesn't recharge. So when you've got somebody on your back, they're taking your... Limited health straight off you, regardless of your shield condition. So you need to get out yeah. and deal with them. Um, so there are ways to fight them. Every pilot's equipped with the anti-Titan weapon, which is normally a heavy weapon like a rocket launcher, a grenade launcher, something like that that can penetrate the shields and do some serious damage. And it it causes pilots who are very vulnerable, but it causes them to be almost like a, uh, a stinging wasp, diving and out, hitting yeah. them hard and getting back out. So a good pilot can still fight a Titan fairly effectively, but a Titan can also deal with them very, very quickly if they're a good pilot, if they're, if they're a good Titan to pilot. Um, Titan versus Titan combat's also a lot of fun. It feels heavy, it feels weighty. Your weapons feel like you're really, really hammering on your enemies. Uh, giving them a good old smack in the face is really, really satisfying. And when a Titan's health is depleted, it gets uh, it goes into a mode called Doomed Mode, where you have a, a countdown, your light bar starts counting down in like a kind of black and yellow... A warning bar and it counts down and if you're inside a titan who's, who's doomed you need to get out of there and you can hammer on the, you can hammer on a button that ejects you straight out of it uh, or you can just climb out but if another titan comes up to you when you're when you're doomed and does a melee attack on you they'll either rip your arms off and smash your cockpit with them <laughs> or they'll smash their fist into your cockpit grab you out and throw you away like garbage and uh grabbing some fucking doomed pilot out of his titan and just tossing them away is like so, it's just so much fun it's ridiculous yeah, you know, it's it ends up being a very fast paced. It's almost like guerrilla warfare because you've got to you can't be out in the open. You've got to do these sort of hit and run attacks on every person you come across. Yeah. Um. It's it's a bit more. And yeah, you have to be thinking on your feet as to which ledges you're going to run up there. And it's just I think it takes an extra degree of skill and maybe you know wit to get around rather than your Call of Duty games. Yeah, you've got to think about it, because while you can walk around these levels like a, like a soldier planted to the ground, you're going to get killed a lot. You're right, you're kind of constantly on the run, constantly watching your back. You can't camp. I've never found a place in the game where you can camp, because there's always six ways into any area, and you're going yeah. to get fucked. Worst, I mean, worst case scenario, there's always windows in every building, because pilots can jump through them. But worst case scenario is you camp down in a room, and all of a sudden a titan sticks his gun through the window and blows your fuck up. You know, there's nothing you can do about that. Um... So, you know, there is a you, you do have to be have a degree of awareness that you probably don't on other shooters, uh, like other military style shooters. 
um, which is good. It, you know, you kind of constantly feel that's a constant surge of adrenaline. You're constantly running. You're constantly on the move. You're constantly trying to kill people who are just as agile as you, or at least trying to get away from these fucking giant monsters of metal who are trying to crush you very, very quickly. And it's breathless. It's completely fucking erratic, and it's it's great. I mean, everything. Uh, there's like there's several different game modes, and they're all. There's not really a bad game mode or a bad map in this game, and I've never played a shooter that has no bad maps before. The there's world, always one. There's always <laughs> one that's shit, but here I have not. There's, there's some maps that are slightly poorer than others, but all of them are good. Uh, they all feel good and they're all fun to play on, which is fucking amazing in, in, in my book. They've done very well. The only thing you can say about the maps is they're all a bit aesthetically similar. There's kind of military base or jungle base, and that's about it. Um, but they're all yeah. very different in layout, uh, different layout and flow, and, and they're, they're really good. But all the game types are great. Uh, you've got hard point, which is kind of like battlefield, whole, capture and hold points. There's attrition, which is basically just deathmatch. You get kills for killing pilots, get kill, uh, you get points for killing titans. And something I didn't touch on, but this is only 6v6, which is actually quite a small match, even in the last generation. You know, 16 player is normally what you have these days, 8v8, not, not 6v6. But what Titanfall does is it tries to create a, um, a kind of atmosphere that you're actually fighting in a war rather than a video game deathmatch. And it populates the levels with kind of uh, grunt troops who are powered by AI and also these robotic hunter-killer squads called Spectres who run around trying to shoot you. And they just... They, add, they don't really add a whole amount of danger. I've rarely, I think I've been killed by a group of these AI once when I was trying to kick a group of six of them to death rather than shoot them. Um, but they add a kind of feel like you're actually fighting in a battle. These are kind of the grunts and the pilot players, uh, the special forces zipping around. And um, these AI, you can also kill these AI people in, in attrition for points as well. Uh, you've got Capture the Flag, and it is the most fucking breakneck, fast and aggressive fl- Capture the Flag I've ever played. I've seen a guy, I've, not, I've never fought anybody like this, but I've seen a video of a guy capturing the flag in 10 seconds. And it's just like, how the fuck do you combat that? But it's just so fast and aggressive. Um, it, it's great fun. And you got to understand why all these kind of game modes are going on. There's still there's pilots jumping around like fucking lunatics, and then there's titans walking around blowing the shit out of everything. There's a ton of stuff going on in any any match, and it's just really really hectic. Uh, so the la- I think the last two game modes are uh, last titan standing, where everyone spawns in their own titan, and basically you've got to kill the whole, all the other team's titans. You've only got one life, but if you get if your titan gets blown up, you can eject and try and take down people's uh, robots from fo- from foot. Um, that's quite fun, although it's a bit too stoppy starty for my liking. It's a bit like, uh, you know, it's done in rounds. And you've also a pilot hunter, which basically you only get kills for killing other players. But that kind of takes away the fun of blowing up titans and killing squads of the eye. And so I prefer attrition to that. But uh, there's also a yeah. pretty good mode called uh, Variety Pack or Grab Bag or something, where it basically it, it pairs you in random rounds um, of varying different modes. So one mode, you're attrition, next to your last titan standing, then you capture the flag. And because none of the game modes are bad or particularly frustrating, it's you know it's a good way to keep things varied and interesting. So it's 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 very very good. Um, so yeah, I mean Titanfall, it does a lot. It does a lot right. Um, it does a lot different, and what it does different, it gets very very right. I think the Titans are a great addition. The I mean what I was thinking when I was thinking about it, I did the yeah the written review earlier, and. Yeah. Um, what I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, the Titans are something kind of different, but I think when you boil them down, they're actually just a kind of vehicle, you know, like we've, we've had vehicles for ages now in shooters. But when I was thinking about it, the Titans are actually feel far more balanced than most vehicles in games. Yeah, well, I mean, when I was in one, I never managed to make properly decent use out of it because I, I didn't know how to play the game and I was just easy pickings for um, people on the feet, like just normal pilots running around so whereas yeah you get in normal in normal games like a tank in battlefield or yeah wraith in halo you're always going to get even noobs in them are going to cause some mass destruction yeah it's not really the case here and i really like that you know that you, yeah you always feel big and powerful in a titan but you're very vulnerable and they're on a two minute timer excuse me they're on a two minute timer so if your titan gets blown up you've got to wait two minutes to get your next one. So they're always kind of constantly coming up and you know, going down. They don't last a long time. Even a good pilot probably won't last all that long. 
But while they do, you do feel powerful. It's just how much you manage to get done while you're in one. Yeah, um, definitely. Which I really liked. And, and I mean, speaking of uh, like speaking of like people who are new to the game and the newbies to the genre, Tankfall actually does a, a number of things to kind of encourage people to jump in and start playing first-person shooters. It has a few weapons that are more newbie-friendly, like you've got the smart pistol, which you don't actually aim so much as you just kind of highlight targets and it homes in on them. So it allows people who can't get the hang of aiming with a keyboard or mouse or dual analog sticks to at least have a fighting chance. But at the same time, it's hampered enough that it requires like a two, three second aiming window for it to lock on. That if you are coming up against an experienced player, they are probably going to kill you. So it gives bad players or new players a bit more wiggle room without making them overpowered with a stupid weapon. Um... So I, I, I like that, and also I, I mentioned the uh, the AI bots that are running around the uh, the levels. Uh, even even somebody who's shit at this game is going to be able to kill those and contribute points to the scoreboard, which is good, and it makes you feel powerful, uh, you know, as a newbie. So I quite like that. And I can see other first person shooters maybe adopting some of these tactics in the, in the future yeah. if they're trying to appeal to maybe a wider audience. Because um, I think games are starting to go to a wider audience past people who play first person shooters. Um, so maybe we'll see see things like that coming uh, coming in in the future. But uh, I think the fact that Titanfall sold so well without a single player campaign is evidence of that. Because I think the last well the last one that I can remember purely multiplayer matches like this was um, I mean you could argue that Left 4 Dead did it, but I would say that the closest thing to Titanfall that there is was Shadowrun on the 360. Uh, yeah, that's probably the last one that springs to mind. Really, um, yeah. And that just didn't sell well at all. We like the, everyone bought um, Crackdown. I think that's the weekend the Crackdown came out, and everyone bought Crackdown purely for the reason it came with a Halo Three beta code. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. essentially, Shadowrun. I think the company got shut down like three days they launched the game. And yeah, Shadowrun did not. I just last don't think we were ready for that sort of game then. I mean, certainly, um, a few years ago, if you said to me. The next Halo game is not going to have any single player component. I'd be a bit surprised. Wait, I can see it happening now. Yeah. I'm not going to think mean, it's not going to go down the Titanfall route, but I'm sure I've heard rumors of an open world sort of Destiny style game. And I can see that happening. But if you told me that Halo wasn't going to have a single player campaign, I would be surprised. Yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, Titanfall does have a campaign. It's, it's what they're deeming. Yeah. They're, they're dubbing a multiplayer campaign. And to be honest, it's one of the game's kind of shortcomings. All it is is a fixed playlist of matches that you're playing in order. And before every each before the match starts, uh, you're given kind of like a little in-engine cutscene that sweeps straight into the battle. And you, there's a lot of radio chatter over the course of the battle that kind of fills in the blanks of the story. I haven't played the story mode in two weeks, and I can remember fucking nothing about it. It's very forgettable. Yeah. And if the only thing I remember is that it ends on a kind of very ambiguous note that either leaves room for a sequel or DLC campaign missions to come out. Um, yeah. But I really, I really don't care. I feel like Respawn made this game like a multiplayer game, and we're like, oh shit, we've actually built quite a, a big universe. We need to at least explain it somehow. What do we do? Well, certainly, I didn't, up until launch, I don't think they'd mention the pseudo-campaign. So I'm guessing it was a thing tacked on at the end. Yeah, it's it's not great. Um, you play through it, like, you, you basically, the, you play through it once as one side, and the, you, the, the two sides you play as uh, are the IMC, who are like a private military company, and then the other group are the militia, who are kind of the rebels. And you'll play through as the IMC, then the militia, and you play through exactly the same missions, just on the opposite side, basically, and see you kind of get the radio chatter for each team rather than the other one. Um, and you're never gonna once you play through it once, you're probably never going to play through it again. I don't think. Yeah, there's, um, well, there's, doesn't, there's no need, is there? Because you'll just be doing. Yeah, um, you're probably just going to play anyway. Yeah, that's it. You're probably just going to classic multiplayer, which is what they're deeming the normal ones. So that that's fine. But uh, yeah, I don't necessarily hold. Is it anything? The... I was just going to ask: Is it anything like Spartan Ops? Kind of. Probably not as fleshed out as Spartan Ops, to be honest. Right, because the thing with Spartan Ops, I can't remember the storyline of that. It's like you watch it, and that's a decently animated film, and the storyline's quite interesting, and then you get into the battle. And then, yeah, I can't remember anything that happened, so it just sounds a bit similar. It kind of is. It kind of is. Um, except, I think, honestly, I think Spartan Ops probably had a, a bit more developed of a story, because it had fully fledged, kind of big ass CGI cutscenes that. That are apparently going to lead into the next Halo, whereas this just yeah. 
was kind of like little sequences tacked on the beginning and end that that kind of happened in right. a map in engine it, it's weird to describe but um i don't know i uh, suppose i could quite happily just get, let them do away with it in future and just kind of yeah. do the it, battlefield approach where you've got three armies or whatever fighting and you don't really have to know why <laughs> yeah well christ i'm sure the titanfall explains the situation better than battlefield 4 did <laughs> Probably just a little bit. And they had a proper campaign. Jesus. Well, maybe they shouldn't have. Maybe they should have went the Battlefield route. Uh, sorry, the, the Titanfall route and, and polished some of the fucking I agree with you. Just do it. If you're going to have a heavy game, five years ago, that wouldn't fly. These days, I don't have time to sit and play through a shitty multiplayer, a shitty campaign. Just, yeah, I agree. Just get to the multiplayer if you have to. Yeah. It, it honestly feels like Respawn trying to explain and pad out their new universe for the sake of it rather than just wanting to do it but uh, honestly yeah. I, I'm not going to hold the campaign against them because it is a shortcoming of the game but it honestly feels like a, an added extra rather than a, a like a fully yeah, fledged mode not... if I was going to review the game I would not I would mention that feature was there and then not pass any judgement on it yeah it's it's okay it seems it's okay. but um, so yeah it's, I mean Titanfall is really good I've had a shit ton of fun on it it's, it's crazy uh, the, the graphics as well I haven't really touched on the graphics but the graphics are very nice um, they're very, very pretty. I'm playing on PC, so I think they're probably a little higher res and probably the frame rate's a bit better on the PC. I'm not really sure the technical specs on the Xbox One, but PC version I'm running on kind of full max specs and it looks pretty nice. It actually has improved since launch. They've, uh, they've continued to patch and support it. And it, it does, I mean, one day I patched it and one day I turned it on and it looks better than it had. Um, yeah. So it, it is nice, but at the same time, this doesn't blow me away like Second Sons did. did, uh, did, did. There's no reason this couldn't have been on previous gen, and, and I know it is coming out on the Xbox 360. Yeah. In fact, is it is it out on the Xbox 360? I think now? it is. Yeah. Um, but that is not the same game. That is that was developed by a completely different studio as a kind of afterthought. I don't know if it's any good or not. I don't know nothing about the 360 version. I see. This feels like there's honestly feel like there's no reason why the 360 version couldn't have had the the respawn entertainment version with like shit textures or something just to just to get the gameplay on there. Um, yeah. Nothing about it really blows me away in the graphical department. But never, I mean, regardless, this is a really, really good shooter. It's it's one of the most original and fun shooters I've played in a lot, a long time. I mean, the the weekend, the first weekend it came out, I probably had about twenty hours on it. Um, I put a shit ton of time in, it and, I, and I, I'm still dipping in and out between my infamous and Reaper Souls for concessions. Yeah, um, I'm just I'm finding I've got too much to play at the moment, but I have dipped into this game a shit ton and it's well, I was going to say the, the beauty of um, Titanfall looks to me is just it's so fast to get into a game and a match is played what between 7 and well 15 minutes would be a long one yeah it's very quick so you can just nip in have a quick game go to bed or whatever you know or, yeah. or, or go like you know put your tea on play a match then have your tea type of thing it's uh, yeah. it's great um, I'm really enjoying it um, the only downside is I had to install Origin on my PC so that's another <laughs> game uh, <laughs> That's another fucking game catalog uh, shop interface I've got on the PC. Let's get, I'm getting too many, um, but never mind. <laughs> um, so yeah, Titanfall. I'm having a real, real good fun. Uh, I, I'd honestly say you could easily recommend this for full price. I got it very cheap. <laughs> um, I you don't mention this. <laughs> I, I'm not going to say how, but I got it very, very cheap, <laughs> and I uh... we're so we're so well known now that we got in touch with Respawn and. Uh, <laughs> They give Ben a copy to uh, to review. Yeah, I didn't I didn't VPN to Mexico or anything uh, <laughs> to download it for pesos instead of pounds. <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I got it for really cheap. So I'm fucking. I, I got the game and the uh, the season pass for less than the PC version costs at retail in this country. It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's fucking ridiculous. But even if you had to pay the full £50 for the yeah. Xbox One version, it's worth it. It, it. If you've got an Xbox One, much like I said with Infamous Second Sons, this isn't a reason, this isn't good enough to be a reason on its own for you to go out and buy an Xbox One, especially seeing as it's available on PC and there's a version of it available on 360. But if you're looking for an excuse to go and buy an Xbox One, this is yeah. probably going to be that thing that tips you over the edge and gets you to buy one. It's a very, very good shooter. I am going to probably be playing it for quite a while yet, um, probably years to come, just jumping on and off. And I really, yeah. really do hope that 
it does go multi-platform in the future because I think there is some chance of it happening and it'd be great for the, the PS4 to get a shooter like this, you know, and just and just get more gamers exposed to it because it's a great franchise and, and I wish Respawn all the all the best for the future. Um, yeah, like what they, they do. As long as they don't nickel and dime me with shit DLC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, just, just before we kind of uh, close on Titanfall, though, did you see the April Fool's joke that they published for it? No, I did not. They announced a Optimus Prime Titan uh, <laughs> DLC. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and it looked, like, the thing is, it looks fucking amazing. And then they're like, no, nah, we're just joking. That'll uh, be like, in it. You, can, you know that'll be in it at some point. That'll well, be in. They had like proper mock ups of it and everything, and it looked awesome. Yeah. And then they're like, no, nah, it's just a joke. <laughs> they'll have a full Transformers bundle for $8, like eight, eight, just before Christmas. I think it'd be something. awesome, man. Everybody gets a randomly assigned Transformer. And, like, the militia you get the yeah. Autobots and the, the fucking IMC you get the Decepticons. That would be great. I think that would be really fun. But... It's three snakes on a plane. It's going to be like, oh, people online heard about this and they want it so badly, we will give it to them. It's going to happen. <laughs> I hope so. It'd be a lot of fun. But, yeah, Titanfall fall. It'll be better than snakes on a plane as well. <laughs> um, okay. There's the VGRS... Show no, the VGR <laughs> show from Screenhog UK. Such yeah. a catchy name. Oh, it's it's rolls a, right off the top. I know. We'll get used to it. We'll get used to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, goddamn, we've been going a long time. Uh, so yeah, we'll definitely wrap up. We uh, so what, 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 yeah. what have we covered tonight? We'll cover Titanfall, which is uh, yeah, a great game. Infamous, another good game. Reaper of Souls, which is fucking amazing. <laughs> and... South Park, which is short but still worth it. Yeah. So goddamn, we played quite a lot. Um, and yeah. I'm, I'm at the moment working my way through Fez. Oh yeah, on, so we'll talk about Vita. that next time. Uh, yeah, I'm playing on my um, Vita. It's what I've been playing. I, when I was wearing my uh, business trip this week, I, I was playing that kind of on a night. And it's such a cute little game. It's amazing. So I, I, yeah. we'll definitely talk about that next time. And I believe... I'll probably have a blast through um, episode two, uh, season two of Walking Dead because there'll be a few episodes. And so, um, yeah, I'll cover that. And I believe uh, Cash will be back with us next time, and he'll have uh, Dark Souls 2 to talk about. And I'll probably be very excited by them as well. Sure. Yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah. So we'll be back in a, about a month's time uh, with that show. So remember, you can just, uh, well, excuse me, I'll do my, I'll do my normal spiel, spiel about the, uh, the social aspects, should I? Yes, <laughs> go, go ahead. So if you want to get more screenhog.co.uk, you can always, of course, like our page on Facebook, subscribe to our Twitter, or, or what is it, a tweet feed, a Twitter feed, Twitter feed, <laughs> tweet feed, I don't know, and you can subscribe to our Twitter feed, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we do put all of our podcasts up on there now for easy viewing. Of course, you can also just get the podcast delivered directly to iTunes if you subscribe to us via there, or of course, put our RSS feed into any uh, podcatcher, I suppose you call them, out yeah. of your choice, and you'll get everything sent to you direct, ready to listen. Of course, you can always just visit us at screenhog.co.uk for all of our written articles and little bit bells and whistles, so uh, other than that, we'll be coming um, up with another show next week. Yeah, and can we also give a shout out to UK Podcasting, who yeah. have um, added us to their library of uh, services, I guess. Yeah, so we're out there you now. find us there. And we're, if you found out about this through there, thanks for listening. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be back with another uh, VGR show. VGR... <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with another VGS, VGRS. I don't know. Do we, do we want to call it VGRS? We'll call it Vigra, and then we can have a picture of Booker on the logo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we'll be back with another video game review <laughs> show in about four weeks' time. And, of course, we'll be back with yet another podcast next week. Uh, what is the podcast we're doing next week? Um, movie news, yeah. Uh, so no. that'll be the front row. I'm gonna say it's not that. <laughs> well, because we do, we alternate between movies and video games, and we also alternate between news and reviews. So it should be the opposite of what we did this week, is how uh, I remember it. Well, I believe it's actually going to be Take 2014. Do you? All right. <laughs> We're going to be back next week with a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So thanks very much.